call the 2340th meeting of the Milwaukee City Council to order. This meeting is being conducted in person and by video conference. The public has been invited to watch this meeting in person at City Hall, on the City's YouTube channel, on Comcast Cable Channel 30 in City Limits, or through the Zoom webinar. There will be opportunities for the public to give oral testimony during today's meeting. When it is time to take public comments, staff will look for in-person meeting attendees to submit a yellow comment card, monitor the email inbox, the Zoom participant list, and the Zoom chat to see if anyone would like to speak. We will take comments in the order that they are received and seen. The public may submit written comments on the yellow comment card or by email to OCR at MilwaukeeOrgan.gov. Spanish translation services are available upon request. The public is asked to request translation and other meeting accessibility services at least 48 hours before the meeting. Contamos con servicio de traducción al español cuando sea solicitado. Se pide a público que solicite servicios de traducción y otros servicios de accesibilidad para reuniones por lo menos 48 horas antes de la reunión. Translation services are also available in other languages. The public is asked to request translation and other meeting accessibility services at least 48 hours before the meeting. Do you all have to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The city of Milwaukee respectfully acknowledges that our community is located on the ancestral homeland of the Clackamas people. In 1855, the surviving members of the Clackamas signed the Willamette Valley Treaty, also known as the Kalyapuya Etc. Treaty, with the federal government in good faith. We offer respect and gratitude to the indigenous people of this land. All right, announcements. Get those up? I will, yes, sir. Okay. The next open mic and poetry reading on Zoom will take place this Friday, August 6th, from 6 30 to 8 p.m. The featured readers for July are the St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church Community. Uh, the open mic will follow. Email Tom Hogan to register. The second of five Carefree Sunday pop up events is coming on Sunday, August 8th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Wichita Park. Grab a disc and go for an ace at a pint-sized uh, disc golf course. All are welcome to attend. Have you been uh, wanting to upgrade your gas-powered yard tools? PGE is hosting an electric tool exchange on Sunday, August 8th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at City Hall during the Milwaukee Sunday Farmer's Market. Community members can bring their old gas-powered lawnmowers, leaf blowers, chainsaws, and trimmers to be recycled for free and receive a gift card to purchase a new electric tool uh, from Ace Hardware. Just be sure to empty all flows from the tools before bringing them to the exchange. Visit the city calendar to find the link to RSVP. The third of five Carefree Sunday pop-up events takes place on Sunday, August 15th. Recording in progress. From 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Stanley Park. Get ready for some outdoor fun that's full of giggles, games, and other activities. Join the Johnson Creek Watershed Council on Saturday, August 21st from 8.30 a.m. to noon to help create a healthier Johnson Creek. Daniel Volunteer Cleanup will once again include in-water trash pickup, which is so important to the health of our stream. Uh, volunteers are required to register by site to keep the groups small so that so social distancing is possible. For more information about each of these events and others, please visit the city's homepage where you can find the city calendar at milwaukeeoregon.gov or call 503-786-7555 and staff will provide you with the information you need or connect you with someone who can help. Can I add a couple more yes, items? Um, one is um, 
this Saturday night is a uh, drive-in movie. NC Carity's doing Saturday night movies. Some of them are in the park, like Bring a Blanket, and some of them are drive-ins. And this Saturday, it's a drive-in movie at the Aquatic Center. Uh, it's Night at the Museum. It costs $5 a carload. And you do need to register in advance because it's they have limited spaces. Um, but you can find that on the NCPRD website or Facebook page. Um, that's North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District. Sorry, I'm so used to speaking in acronyms. Um, and the other thing is, uh, in addition to Johnson Creek cleanup, there's a cleanup on Fernberg Park on Wednesday, on Wednesday evening from 5 to 7. It's August 18th, two weeks from tomorrow. It's NCPRD, it's the Linwood Neighborhood Association. It's the North Clackamas Watersheds Council. It's kind of a group, uh, a, a, a collective effort um, to clean up Fernberg Park uh, for anyone who wants to join in that. Um, 5 p.m. Fernberg Park is in the Linwood neighborhood just off of uh, Linwood Avenue. Um, and I'll just also put in a pitch off of the Carefree Sunday things that the mayor announced. I went to the one yesterday and kids were having a lot of fun. <laughs> there was a lot of fun to be had, so hopefully uh, there will be more this weekend. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Is the chief joining us virtually or? He is. He's on the Okay. Let me go ahead and stop the sharing tab and I will bring him over to Screen. All right, the next item uh, will be the Milwaukee, Milwaukee Police Department's Life Saving Awards. This will be presented by our police chief, Luke Strait. Good evening, uh, Mayor Gamble, members of council, and members of the community. My name is Luke Strait, I'm the chief of police for the city of Milwaukee. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here this evening to recognize the actions of several members of our department in two different incidents that's, that have happened over the course of the last few months. Uh, as you all know, uh, this past year has been uh, challenging in uh, a million different ways for everyone, um, each in their own kind of unique ways. Uh, I know for our folks, it's important that we kind of take a time, a time out occasionally in the middle of whatever's going on to celebrate uh, things that went well, to celebrate our successes. And I know that's important for everyone else uh, with the city and in the community as well. Uh, so that's what I, what I briefly wanted to do here this evening. There are two different incidents that I want to talk about. And uh, the first one involves um, Officer Ronnie Len, who was able to join us tonight, and Officer Brian Johnson, who I think is uh, in the middle of his sleep schedule. And I believe technically uh, Officer Glenn was as well, but I might have uh, battered him until he woke up. Uh, the commendation explains these stories um, well, so I'd like to just go ahead and read that first commendation now to tell the story. On April 20th, 2021, Milwaukee police officers were dispatched to assist paramedics on a possible overdose call. The initial information involved a 24-year-old male who was unconscious, not breathing, and CPR was actively being administered. Officer Brian Johnson was the first officer to arrive at the scene, and he assessed the patient who was pale, was losing all color from lack of blood, and had no pulse. Uh, two community members, Alyssa Wilson and Kirsty Hool, uh, who had happened to be nearby visiting neighbors, have begun administering CPR minutes before the arrival of Officer Brian Johnson and Officer Ron Glenn. When Officer Johnson learned the man likely had overdosed, he immediately administered a single dose of Narcan, which is used to counter the effects of opioid overdose. He then took over performing chest compressions and rescue breathing, while Officer Glenn worked to stabilize the scene and assisted with the deployment of an automated external defibrillator uh, still waiting for paramedics to arrive. The man regained partial consciousness just before paramedics arrived and was transported to an area hospital. In reviewing the timeline for this incident, it took just under two minutes from when Officer Johnson and Officer Glenn were dispatched on the call to the time Narcan was administered. The immediate response of Officer Johnson and Glenn, their quick actions combined with the selfless intervention 
of Ms. Wilson and Ms. Gould is a great example of how a community like Milwaukee comes together under challenging circumstances and their teamwork that evening to save the life. Since the call, officers have been in communication with the family and friends of the patient and have received updates on his condition. Those officers learned the patient was stable, recovering, and very grateful to be alive. Officer Johnson, Officer Glenn, Ms. Wilson, and Ms. Sewell should all be commended for their quick, decisive actions and their compassionate response to a person on the verge of death. Our community is better because each of you are in it. Um, aside from the commendation, uh, I want to really thank those officers who are here that we can see on the screen and those who have uh, maybe joined anonymously because they're shy as well. Um, some of our officers are taking calls as we speak now. And for some of them, this is kind of the middle of their night. So for those who are unable to join us, I know they will watch the meeting afterwards. And I'm going to go right into the second uh, commendation. And I'll go ahead and read the story on that. I want to give a slight disclaimer on this. Uh, this one does involve a, uh, a violent incident where there were weapons involved. And this commendation does briefly talk about the injuries. Um, Despite that disclaimer, I don't think it's worse than the evening news on any given day of the week. Um, and I also want to preface this, uh, that instance, instances like this are very unusual in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, but that low frequency combined with really high risk incidents um, can end bad really quickly. Uh, so when they end as well as possible, that's all the more reason for us to talk about them. Uh, and acknowledge how well things went under challenging circumstances. I'm going to go ahead and read that commendation. On the evening of June 5th, 2021 at 7.25 p.m., Milwaukee officers David McVeigh, Daniel Duke, Brad Walther, and Sergeant Jeff Rogerson were dispatched to the transit center located at Maine and Jackson in Milwaukee on a report of a stabbing which had just occurred. The witness who called reported the victim was on the ground yelling, and that a suspect who was armed was walking away, but still in the general area. Medical services were dispatched on the call, but advised not to go to the victim's aid because the scene was not safe. Paramedics responded, but staged, waiting for police to arrive and secure the scene for their safety. Within three minutes of receiving the first 911 call, five-year veteran officer David McVeigh was the first officer to arrive on scene, initially alone. Upon arrival, he looked at the victim who was on the ground, yelling and bleeding from several stab wounds. The victim pointed out the suspect, who Officer McVeigh could see was approximately 50 yards away and was walking away from them. The victim told Officer McVeigh that during the course of the attack, the suspect also took a handgun from the victim. Officer McVeigh immediately relayed the suspect description, the current location, and the fact that the suspect was armed with both a knife and a handgun to responding officers who had begun to arrive at that location. Officer McVeigh, despite being in a dangerous and chaotic situation, began medically assessing the victim's injuries. Officer McVeigh found the victim had several deep stab wounds, one in his chest and one in his back, and a deep laceration of life-threatening arterial bleeding on his right arm. Officer McVeigh quickly applied a tourniquet to the victim's arm to stop the heavy bleeding. He then used trauma shears to remove, remove the victim's shirt to allow paramedics to more quickly treat the victim when they arrived. He then began treating those wounds using gauze and direct pressure to stop the bleeding. Officer McVeigh also obtained critical details through an interview about what had happened and relayed that information to the other responding units. He also talked to the victim, uh, advising the victim to breathe deeply uh, to counteract the effects of shock. At 7.28 p.m., which was four minutes after the initial 911 call, Sergeant Jeff Rogerson, Officer Brad Walther, Officer Daniel Duke located the suspect who was still armed a short distance away and safely took him into custody with no further incident. Once the suspect was in custody, the scene was declared safe for paramedics and Officer McVeigh requested paramedics respond go three to his location. He advised them of the nature of the injuries that a tourniquet had been applied and also requested that detectives be notified and respond immediately. Sergeant Rogerson, Officer Duke, 
and Officer Walther are commended for their professionalism in this incident. The emergency room doctor at OHSU later told investigators the victim's injuries were definitely life-threatening, and if not for the officer's actions, the man likely would not have survived. Officer McVeigh is to be commended for his exceptional professionalism, valor, and performance under extreme stress. Officer McVeigh is a credit to the law enforcement profession and the Milwaukee Police Department. Once again, instances like this are very rare, um, which means we don't always have the opportunity to perfect how we respond to, to situations that are as critical as this. Uh, that means the, the risk of mistakes happening or things not going as smooth as possible goes up a little bit. Uh, and in this in incident, uh, things, despite the way they started out and what the incident was, um, were handled extremely well by our people. And I just wanted to take some time out of our evening to acknowledge their fantastic work and the impact in both of these instances that they made in the lives of uh, members of our community. I just uh, want to commend you, Chief, and your entire team. Um, I have say this over and over and over, but uh, in my opinion, Milwaukee has the best police force in the state, and it's incidents like these that, that prove that point out time after time. And I just uh, couldn't be more proud of, of our team. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to those officers who were able to respond so quickly in a moment when I would have been frozen. Uh, I'm sitting here at a loss for the, the grief I feel at the circumstances people in our community find themselves in. Um, and thank you for making it possible for those people to go on living, literally. Thank you, Council President Heisey. Um, sometimes these things aren't super pleasant to talk about. And, uh, we hate to drop a heavy mood on the, uh, the council meeting and agenda, but it is important that we, that we talk about the challenges of, of life and of this job in particular, and acknowledge the work of our people. So thank you for making time for us. And I also want to make sure that we thank and uh, acknowledge the two women that started CPR on first case that you know, particularly in a pandemic uh, I'm sure a lot of people would have second thoughts about, about that and it's really possible their bravery as well absolutely we did also invite them to the meeting but uh, um, for for reasons including the pandemic and also maybe just being shy and not wanting to be on camera at a public meeting um, they respectfully declined that opportunity, but we did profusely thank them for their actions. Hopefully they're watching at least. Um, what stood out to me, and I just I want to just thank you so much for, and, and the two women and the public too, um, is the compassion, not just, you know, not just the response time. I mean, that's obviously very impressive, and I think all of this, you know, all of the, the skills that everyone, used and deployed and, and all the tools that we had available and I'm really grateful for that. But I, I think it, at the core there was real compassion shown to these people who were, you know, suffering in, in, in a very, um, not, a, not a great place, probably the worst moment of their lives. And the fact that you know, two strangers, including in, in addition to members of our law enforcement, um, actually felt compelled to intervene is, is just that's it's really wonderful. I'm sure that the families and friends of those two people are extremely grateful. Thank you. And Chief, this is Anne. You can't see me on the screen, but I am speaking. Um, I do also really appreciate, I know that our officers often feel like this is their job and that this is something that they're supposed to do. But I think it's also important for us as a community to acknowledge the hard things that they're doing and to thank them. So I also just thank them for coming on to the call um, and putting themselves out there tonight uh, to, to receive what is very appropriate recognition and appreciation. So thank you all for being here tonight. 
Thank you, folks. Thank you. Um, our next item is National Farmers Market Week proclamation. Uh, who from She's Salt Lake, Milwaukee? Melanie Bennett. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Melanie Bennett. Melanie Bennett from Salt Lake, Milwaukee. Yeah. Well, present. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, well, good evening, Mayor Gamba and City Council. My name is Melanie Bennett. I'm a resident of Milwaukee and also the board president of Celebrate Milwaukee Incorporated, or CMI, which is the parent organization of the Milwaukee Farmers Market. I'm uh, happy to be here virtually tonight to hear your proclamation in support of National Farmers Market Week. Um, farmers markets are an increasingly important part of the food network in our country, and we're very fortunate here in Milwaukee to have our own market, which is still going strong in its 23rd season. Over the course of the pandemic, it's been especially important to have access to fresh food, including food support programs such as SNAP, WIC, and Double Up Food Box, as well as the opportunity for people to shop out doors if they're more comfortable with that, and of course the ability to support local farmers, producers, and other small businesses. And we are very fortunate to be able to provide all of that at the market with support from our many partners. CMI deeply appreciates the support we receive from the city, which has helped the market grow into one of our community's strongest and best loved institutions. Especially over this past year and a half, as rule and concerns grew and changed weekly. The city was a fantastic partner and we're grateful for that. Thank you for your support today of National Farmers Market Week and thank you also for your support year round of the Milwaukee Farmers Market. Well, thank you. It's another another thing that folks in Milwaukee have a lot of pride in and enjoy very much. I know that every Sunday it's, uh, it's almost like a mild party. No, it's just people are just smiling and happy and uh, getting to socialize and see friends and buy amazing fruits and vegetables and meats and everything else. So, thank you for doing that. Uh, whereas farmers markets are an integral part of Oregon's food system and agricultural economy. Whereas the 130 plus farmers markets in Oregon are important sales outlets for farmers and food business owners, generating revenue that supports the sustainability of family farms and the revitalization of rural communities. And whereas farmers markets provide citizens of all income levels with access to healthy, healthful, locally produced foods through the Milwaukee Farmers Market and over 70 other Oregon markets that accept supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits and other critical food access programs. And whereas the Milwaukee Farmers Market is celebrating 23 years is the cornerstone of our community, well loved by customers, neighbors, and vendors alike. And whereas the City Council recognizes the importance of expanding agricultural marketing opportunities is that assist and encourage the next generation of farmers and ranchers to generate farm income to help simulate business development and job creation build community connections through rural and urban languages, provide access to fresh, healthy food for all of Oregon citizens and more. Now, therefore, I, Mark Gamba, the mayor of the city of Milwaukee, and the municipal corporation of the county of Clackamas, in the state of Oregon, with the consent of the city council, do hereby proclaim the week of August 1 through 7, 2021, as National Farmers Market Week, in conjunction with the National Farmers Market and do call upon all Milwaukeeans to celebrate farmers markets with the appropriate observance and activities. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next proclamation is the Climate Collaborative Campaign Proclamation. Presented by our Climate Natural Resources Manager, Natalie Rogers. 
Hi. It's a new title since we last saw her. It is. Very exciting. Um, good evening, Mary Gamba, Council President Heisey, and Council. Uh, so my name is Natalie Rogers. I'm the Washington Natural Resources Manager. And I'm excited to introduce uh, the Climate Collaborative, which we've actually been talking about for a few years now, but we have to get a kick it off this year. So um, as we know, uh, Milwaukee has an amazing climate action plan which was adopted in 2018. And that climate action plan has three pretty aggressive but amazing goals, including being net zero carbon from electricity by 2030, uh, net zero carbon from all building fuels by 2035, and community carbon neutrality by uh, 2045. So cities across Oregon are adopting similar climate action plans, and many of them are actually modeled even after Milwaukee. So we get calls all the time, essentially from staff, saying, hey, this is a fantastic climate action plan. We want to learn how Milwaukee can do it, because we're also a small community, and we want to do it too. So as cities start to adopt these climate action plans, and communities start to have these climate action efforts, um, essentially became um, realized that we should have this kind of umbrella campaign which supports communities in raising awareness of their climate action plans. So uh, led by Portland General Electric in partnership with the City of Milwaukee and Energy Trust of Oregon, this year we're doing a climate collaborative. So this is a model that other communities can actually adopt themselves and be involved in the campaign, and Milwaukee's just the first one taking it off. So it's a celebration of local climate action plans as well as community events, uh, volunteerism, community-based organizations, uh, all under the umbrella of climate action. So we started planning this in 2019 for a lot of in-person events and activities, including even a youth summit. And unfortunately, with the pandemic, we had to kind of bring it into the virtual space and kind of trim it down to make it so, at least for this first time, uh, we can ensure its success. So for now, the Climate Collaborative is a primarily an online event focused around a climate pledge, which is available on climatecollaborativenorthwest.com. I don't know if we can pull that up or not. Yes. Can you say Climate Collaborative Northwest? Yes. I have it by memory. I can type it in, but your <laughs> name's sure. just a speed with those keys. Uh, site cannot be reached. Climate Collaborative. Oh, sorry. Ah. Details. It's good to have the uh, memory. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. So it's focused around an online pledge that folks can take to essentially um, show their support for Milwaukee's climate action plan. Uh, it also links out to external organizations that uh, also do climate action related work, including our watershed councils, both North Clapham's Watershed Council, our Johnson Creek Watershed Council, Friends of Trees, uh, and then also links to resources to help folks take that first step towards climate action. Uh, so uh, when folks uh, go onto the website that they uh, can enter in their information for uh, to help sign the pledge and then they can also uh, share it, get links to share on their own social media. Uh, and then so while this is an online campaign, we're kind of sprinkling it through with some events that folks in the community can participate in, kicking it off with our electric tool exchange. Uh, we did some demos last weekend and this coming weekend on Sunday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, folks in the community can turn in their gas powered, old gas powered uh, lawn equipment and get gift cards for uh, discounts for electric replacements that are both cleaner for air quality but then also help us achieve our climate action goals. Um, so uh, I encourage folks to uh, visit uh, climatecollaborativenw.com to uh, sign the climate pledge and then also visit us at the farmer's market this coming Sunday to learn a little bit more and get some cool ACE uh, hardware gift cards to go shopping and do a little bit of summer cleanup in their yard. Yeah. Well, and th those small motors that are on those kinds of devices are some of the most polluting uh, motors there are. They, they run really rough. Much of the gasoline just gets ported into the air. Um, they don't have any form of, of you know, collection or control or filtration or anything. They literally are the worst kinds of motors to run. And besides, I've had um, electric motor for probably 
10 years, and in the early days they were a little weak, and people didn't think much of them, but they've gotten really, really good in recent years, and I would put them up against virtually any gasoline-powered mower. Uh, same with the string trimmers. I haven't gotten to use a chainsaw, so I don't know. Those They're are great. really fun. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, our own landscaping contract for transitioning towards electric tools, we're also transitioning towards electric tools for our own city work uh, when possible. And then I personally just bought an electric chainsaw about mm, three weeks ago, and we took down some invasive Portuguese laurel, and it was like cutting through butter. It was wow. just so satisfying. <laughs> uh, so I encourage everyone, if you can get the chance to try them out, because as somebody, I also think that there's like some safety uh, benefits too, because electric chainsaws in particular, you can take your hand off the trigger and it turns off. So I felt much more comfortable with my husband waving them. <laughs> when I stopped by the booth on Sunday, that, that the chainsaw was getting all the attention, I will yep. say. I was, and it's the only thing I don't have. I have the blower, the weed whacker, and the mower electric, but uh, I'm like, ooh, maybe I need that. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say, in addition to the air quality, they're also all much quieter. Yeah. They're much better for your hearing loss issues and uh, your neighbors and being a good neighbor and all of that. They're also much quieter than their gas-powered uh, counterparts. Natalie, what is happening to the uh, used equipment that's being turned There, uh, we are going to have a vendor who's going to be recycling them. So if folks uh, want to, they can help us out by emptying out the fuels from their old equipment before they bring them. Uh, but if they were a little concerned about how to do that, the recycler will help them. Uh, but all the old equipment will be recycled. Great. And I believe I saw a nice fancy new billboard on my way into town on 99. Yeah, nice and so. Yes. So hopefully folks will be seeing it a little bit more around town. And Milwaukee's the first one to pilot it, so we get all of the accolades and all the celebration, and then as uh, more communities work to join the collaborative, they also will get their own celebrations too, but of course the Milwaukee ones will always be the best. <laughs> uh, and I'll also say too, there's other events that we're going to be sprinkling through, including uh, potentially a SOL event coming up, um, and then it's probably going to be, uh, the climate collaborative is going to be ending, but it will be returning next year, but it'll be ending in October likely with the celebration of our Arbor Day. Excellent. All right, well, we'll read the proclamation. Whereas the city of Milwaukee adopted a climate action plan in 2018, establishing goals of net zero emissions from electricity, net zero emissions from building fuels, and community carbon neutrality. And whereas the city council declared a climate emergency in 2020, accelerating the climate action plan goals in response to the urgency of, the climate, of climate change. And whereas Portland General Electric and the city have worked in partnership to accomplish zero carbon electricity through climate action outreach, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and community participation in innovative technology programming. And whereas Portland General Electric, the city, and, Ener and the Energy Trust of Oregon are launching the Climate Collaborative, joint initiative to raise community awareness and community climate action and increase participation in climate-aligned energy initiatives to help the city reach its goals. And whereas the Climate Collaborative will integrate online education, volunteerism, in-person events, and an online climate pledge to celebrate and enhance Milwaukee's dedication to climate action. Now, therefore, I, Mark Gamba, Mayor of the City of Milwaukee, Municipal Corporation, the County Clackamas, and the State of Oregon, do hereby proclaim August 1st as the start of the Climate Collaborative Campaign to raise awareness of Milwaukee's Climate Action Plan and celebrate community, ded community dedication to achieving the city's climate and energy goals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you Sunday. Yeah. Comments. This is the part of the agenda during which council will hear community members' statements regarding city business. Those wishing to speak must fill out a yellow speaker card available on the table in the hall and identify agenda item number five, community comments. If you are attending through the Zoom meeting and 
and wish to speak, please raise your hand or indicate who wish to speak. Before you, uh, before you make your comments, please state your name and city residence for the record. If you would like the city to follow up with you, please submit your contact information to OCR and MilwaukeeOregon.gov. As council has other business items on the agenda this evening, speakers will be limited to three minutes each. Because information provided during any of the comments may be new, the city manager will respond at the next council meeting to those comments and require follow-up. Before we begin, is there any follow-up from the July 20th meeting comments? Ms. Oak? There are not. So do we have anybody online? No, Mayor Gill, but nobody has their hand raised. All right, I have Haney Selbach. Did I pronounce that right? Thank you, Haney. Come on up. Um, use one of these microphones. Oh, okay. no, it's, it's picking up the room, so just oh, please have a seat. At the table, then. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Uh, if I understood correctly, I have three minutes? Three minutes, yeah. All right, well, I thank everyone for being here. Uh, basically, um, there was an issue that occurred in the Hector Campbell neighborhood where I live. Uh, that I believe could be part of a larger issue, or maybe even there could be a solution. Uh, basically, there's six different households that have written and signed letters uh, in regards to noise from one specific household. Now, that specific household has multiple roosters. And basically, they just leave the roosters out before they go to work. They're gone all day. Whatever happens, happens. We have retirees who are literally feel like they can't enjoy their own backyard. We have, you know, families with small children who are woken up from their naps during the day, uh, at night, in the morning. It's it's really frustrating. Um, eventually, after about eight months of complaining, <clears throat> multiple households, uh, Tim Salyers, the code enforcement officer, issued a noise citation, multiple warnings issue a noise citation. The hearing was held in this very room a couple of weeks ago. I was called to be a witness by Tim Salyers, and the judge was from another county. I don't know where she was from, but she didn't understand the, the laws of Milwaukee. She thought roosters were not allowed, Then she found out a couple of minutes before the hearing that roosters were not explicitly banned. So after the hearing, uh, she basically stated that because roosters aren't explicitly banned, that she's not going to issue the noise citation. And I just feel like the laws may not be specific enough because there's laws about keeping animals and noise from keeping animals, which a rooster is an animal, but then there's laws about livestock. And you know, if it's livestock, it has to be commercial. So basically this out of town judge uh, went against the officer said that any noise by the roosters are acceptable because they're not explicitly banned. Um, again, if it was a personal issue, I understand, but given all the households around it, all the letters, all the recording, we sent video footage, we sent audio, uh, I just feel like maybe there's some opportunity uh, in the way the laws are written to remove the ambiguity so that any judge could come and, and, and not really have issue trying to uh, come up with a decision. Uh, it's really uh, all I came here to talk about today. Thank you. Uh, the, I'm sure we've got a record of who the judge was. Yes, the judge. It's an interesting ruling. I mean, cars aren't specifically banned, but if a car doesn't have a muffler and is overly loud, that's when it falls into the, the sound. So I'm not sure. Very strange. Yeah, I, I don't know uh, where she was from, but she she stated multiple times uh, that she was not from this county, and she actually took two weeks to come up with a decision. She said she needed time to read on the laws because she wasn't familiar with them. And uh, after two weeks, okay. Uh, thank you. We will look into this. Thank you. I kind of thought. You and I were on the council, our own planning commission, and the code on that was, and I kind of thought roosters were banned, to be honest. <laughs> well, I've always thought that, I've always known that they weren't banned. Oh, really? Yeah, we've talked about this on this council. Yeah, yeah. they're not banned, but if they're overly loud, then 
the noise ordinance kicks in. Right. So you can, if you have a quiet rooster, you're allowed to have a rooster. Right. right? But that's, so I'm not sure what. Well, I think that we definitely need to just make sure we get bit more information. I think okay. Judge Graves has been our musical judge for several years, at least as long as I've been on council. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure we have all of our information. I think. Yeah. It's certainly fair to want to get the, the code right because we've got thousands of pages of it. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, Anybody else? Yes, uh, Mary Gamble, we have the uh, Reverend Adam Erickson. And let me go ahead and Hi, I am uh, Pastor Adam Erickson at uh, Clackamas United Church of Christ, and I wanted to thank you, Mayor Gamba and City Council members, for uh, all the work that you do. And also, I know that you are um, going to be prioritizing uh, what you're going to be doing in the next uh, year. Um, and I just wanted to come on and encourage you to, to do what you can for the housing crisis in Milwaukee. Um, we know that one of the important solutions to housing crisis is housing affordability. In the Portland area, just in this last year, there was a 19.4% increase uh, in housing. And just from May, uh, uh, from April to May, it increased 9.3%, according to the Oregonian. We know uh, that there are solutions to the housing crisis, and one of the most important solutions is affordable housing. Um, so I just wanted to come on and encourage you to uh, do what you can um, to help keep uh, housing affordable. For those of us who are struggling uh, in this um, financial situation, especially with COVID, but beyond COVID as well. So um, thank you for your time and thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you, Reverend Erickson, um, for all that you don't know that he's, uh, he's quite an outstanding Reverend in our community. And uh, he's got the signboard out on uh, Webster Road that is often uh, seen as somewhat controversial, but it's always right on point. Um, I, I want to go back to your testimony, though. Uh, you said something that I don't think you said it exactly the way you meant to say it. When you said there was an increase, uh, you said in housing. Did you mean in houselessness? Cost. Or in cost of housing? You're muted. Adam, you're muted. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, the cost of housing has gone up 19.4% okay. according to uh, the Oregonian and studies that it cites. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Thank you for um, correcting me. Thank you. That's <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure you got said what you needed to say. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Thanks. Any, are there others? No, there are not. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Tonight's consent agenda includes minutes of the City Council uh, the July 1st, 2021 special session, the July 10th, 2021 council dinner, and the July 13th, 2021 study session. We have a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a required document to accept the American Rescue Plan Act ARPA funds. And that's it. Uh, does any member of council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda as written. I second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Not heard, it passes unanimously. Uh, Council will now proceed to the public hearing on tonight's agenda. We'll return to the business items after the hearing. <coughs> 
solid waste rates adoption resolution. Public hearing on the proposed solid rate solid waste rates is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to take public comment on the proposed solid waste rates. Does any council member wish to announce actual or potential conflict of interest? Seeing none, nor do I. Uh, this will be presented by our finance director, Bonnie Dennis. Hi, Bonnie, welcome back. Hi, thank you. Good evening. I'm Bonnie Dennis, finance director. Um, I am here in place to keep the club the assistant finance director. He's here on a phone notification. Um, so uh, the solid waste rates are being presented, to, were presented to you on June 15th by uh, the consultant Chris Bell from Bell & Associates. Uh, based on that presentation, there was an overall universal price increase that will come into effect on September 1st. Uh, the increase in rates is required to be a public hearing in accordance with the Oregon State statutes, and city staff does anticipate that the city, the, the, the solid waste rates will come back um, during the master fee schedule. I know that was one of the key pieces that was discussed at last meeting, but that will come back to the master fee schedule during the budget process in the spring. Um, that's about all I have. Uh. Let's see. Have you received any additional correspondence on this topic? No, we have not. Okay. Does anyone wish to comment on the proposed rates? Dan, anybody online? Nobody online. We'll skip all of this. Council, have any questions for staff? No. If there are no more questions, I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Well, it's, been, it's been moved and seconded to close the public hearing on the proposed solid waste rates. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And heard? Uh, Public testimony portion of the public hearing on the proposed solid waste waste rates is closed. Is there council discussion? I think we had a great conversation during the presentation last time, and I think we had an opportunity to ask some good questions. I was just reminded as I was coming here today about the bulk waste pickup days and the improvements there, so I don't have anything to add to that conversation. Covered. Right. Then I would entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the resolution adopting solid waste rate service solid waste service rated effective September first, twenty twenty one. Second. Not exactly how that's supposed to be. I think that's supposed to be solid waste service rates. Dan? What's that? Is that uh, yeah. Yes. You concur? Yes. You say it? I move to approve the resolution adopting solid waste service rates effective September 1st, 2021. I'll save lives. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the resolution adopting solid waste uh, service rates effective September 1st, 2021. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And I heard it passes unanimously. All right, Council will now return to the business items part of the agenda. Uh, I think the next item up is the Equity Steering Committee Code Adoption. And this will be presented by our Equity Program Manager, John Henry. Good evening, everyone. Mayor, Council. I can see your main sign right down there. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. You're doing great. Uh, work on that as much. Do all the things. All the things. All the things. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. I'm John Hankin, the Equity Program Manager for the City of Milwaukee. Um, we are here to um, present the um, 
draft or actually the ordinance for you at the uh, steering committee for the city. Um, when we last um, discussed this last month, um, there were a couple of questions about the role of the committee in terms of whether they would be doing the heavy lifting and actually creating a plan for the city. Also questions about their role being advisory. So there are two changes made um, to the ordinance um, to reflect um, the feedback from the council at that time. Um, those are in uh, section 2.2.10 B and C. So those two have been changed um, to reflect in the advisory role and the fact that the council um, will be, or maybe, sorry, will be providing advice to staff and to the council, but not actually doing the, the work product of creating um, um, the plan for the So um, this is the culmination of um, several months of work. We spoke first about this um, last fall, I believe, um, when the city adopted uh, the equity um, uh, priority. Um, when I came on board in November, there was a discussion at that time, um, and, and during subsequent feedback, the uh, decision to support creating an equity steering committee. So this movement would um, create that committee. Um, we've already begun recruitment for that committee. Um, we would like to see more applicants. Um, uh, the committee's role for the city uh, will be a group to um, learn more about our processes and our programs, uh, provide feedback to us on what we're doing well and what we can do better and to hold us accountable to our commitments. So we're looking for a group of people who represent numerous aspects of our community. Um, that is a difficult thing. We need a lot of people to be able to do that well and so the more applications the better. So um, I, I ask um, all of you and anyone listening to please get the word out that we are recruiting. Um, the application deadline is September 3rd. So we have five months to go. Uh, and um, we'd love to see a lot of applicants. We have some wonderful people who have applied so far. We just need more of them. So um, that is the push right now, is to get as many applications as possible. Um, based on that timeline, we expect that um, we will begin meeting sometime in December. That's currently the plan for this group, um, based on the amount of time it takes to get the group together and to start meeting. Um, this group will meet both virtually and in person. That's the, the intent so that um, we can accommodate individuals with disabilities, both physical and developmental, um, and also individuals who may be um, either or um, divergent, um, who may have difficulty coming to us in person, but who can move with us online. So that is the current plan. Of course, the committee will be working on the bylaws uh, as soon as we get started. Is there a Facebook post or something that we could all share? I believe there is one on the city site. I will, if there isn't, we'll make sure there is one. Um, it is also in the current article, actually, in the July pilot. We just have the August pilot coming out. It is in the uh, July pilot, and we will make sure we get something on the website and on Facebook page if it is not the Great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for all your great work on this. It's exciting to be moving this to this level. Well, and I want to add, I, I had reservations when we talked about this during the comprehensive plan process, and my reservations about an equity committee would, that would create something that wouldn't have, um, wouldn't be grounded in the community and grounded in expertise. And I really appreciate that we have you here and that you've put time into getting to know the community and understanding who Milwaukee is as we move forward with this work. And I do I feel like we're in a good place now to make this be something that is actually meaningful, actually empowers our community to, to really take on the, the serious challenges that equity issues and inclusion issues and justice issues present. It's such a delicate and personal arena um, that it has to be done with care, I believe. Otherwise, you end up harming the very people that you intend to help and to hear better. So, so thank you for taking this work so seriously. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, and helping with a community-led process. I think that that was, also, that was part of our concern with the comp plan and that conversation. Um, you know, we weren't where we are today. So, thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I concur. I think the, um, 
in addition to the worry about the delicacy of the work, I think there was also just a worry of creating another committee that was not with a clear mandate. And I think you brought shape to that, and we, we don't have to worry. We don't have that worry anymore. Um, that was, you know, it was sort of like a worry about wasting people's time, you know, because you didn't have a clear definition of what they were, you know, what their goal was. So I think, I think all of those kind of concerns have definitely gone by the wayside for me as well. That's good. Thank you, guys. Right. Well, then, I uh, there's more discussion. I would make a motion. I'll move for the first and second readings by title only and adoption of the ordinance amending municipal code chapter two dot two two to create an equity steering committee (ESC). All right, second. It's been moved and seconded for the first and second readings by title only and adoption of the ordinance amending municipal code chapter two point two two to create an equity steering committee (ESC). Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And then heard. Passes unanimously. Uh, Ms. Over, would you read, please read the ordinance by title only twice? An ordinance of the City of Milwaukee, Oregon, amending Municipal Code Chapter 2.22 to create an equity steering committee, ESC. And again, an ordinance of the City of Milwaukee, Oregon, amending Municipal Code Chapter 2.22 to create an equity steering committee. Thank you. Mr. Harris, will you please call the council? Councillor Falconer? Aye. Councillor Beatty? Aye. Councillor Nicodemus? Aye. Councillor Council President Heisey? Aye. Mayor Gamba? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Ordinance 2207. Very good. Go forth and form. <laughs> um, yeah, please do get us some, you know, things we can share on social on our social media pages. Absolutely. And uh, we'll also reach out beyond that. Are we? Um, I'm trying to remember. It's been a little bit since I read it. Are we requiring that people be up that the entire committee be residents? Only one half of the committee. Only one three residents okay. of the city call. Well, yeah, it says majority. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes, majority. Yeah. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Joe. And Mayor, before we jump into the next piece, if someone is watching this on air and they are having a hard time hearing people, if you go to the YouTube channel, which there's a link at the meeting notice on our website, uh, it's a lot clearer. So for anybody who is struggling tonight, feel free to jump onto the YouTube channel. I'm sorry, onto our link. Or Zoom link that is on the, the council. So, to, to be clear, Zoom is clearer than YouTube. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Ah, okay, I was hearing a Yeah, I was too. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank no, that's great. Thank you. Is that going to affect our final recording? Like, do we need to start no, you're, stepping up our volume here? You're, you're just fine. Um, it's the Zoom recording that's going to ultimately end up getting okay, shown. Okay, great. Perfect. So, next item is the Milwaukee Center renaming a resolution. This will be presented by our Climate and Natural Resources Manager. Hello again. Uh, so, I am here to present a resolution for a name change for our Milwaukee Center to become the Milwaukee Community Center. Uh, in 2019, the Milwaukee Center Community Advisory Board reached out to North Hopkins Parks and Rec District and CPRD to request the name the Milwaukee Center be changed to the Milwaukee Community Center. Uh, the Milwaukee Communities or the Milwaukee Center Community Advisory Board felt that this better reflected the audience uh, and residents who were served by the center and uh, expanded it beyond the um, the senior center that that it was originally founded for, but now expanded into youth programming, all residents programming, education, and more. Um, in June of 2021, so just a few months ago, uh, the Mar uh, Milwaukee Parks and Recreation Board uh, were visited by members from North Parkins Parks and Rec District on the name change process, and they voted to support the name change uh, unanimously. 
Uh, and then just this last July, uh, the NCPRD District Advisory Committee, which has recently reformed, uh, voted to support the new change as well. And so today we bring it to you uh, to see if you would like to vote to approve the name change from Milwaukee Center to Milwaukee Community Center. Very good. Any questions? I have a question about the just the first whereas in the resolution cites uh, that the, the Milwaukee Center provides essential and beneficial services to Milwaukee residents. And I just want to highlight that anyone is able to use the Milwaukee Center. And that facility actually serves residents throughout the North Blackness Parks District who take advantage of the programs and all the cool stuff that happens there. So uh, I, that just stood out to me a little bit in, in the resolution language itself. And I wanted to at least, if not change the language, uh, clarify that, that the Milwaukee Center is in no way limited only to Milwaukee residents, but it's available to the public as a whole. Yeah, I think we might actually want to change yeah, I agree. To, to yeah. remove the word Milwaukee there, or say community residents or something, because there was a there was an effort several years back to actually take Milwaukee yeah. out of the title just because of that kind of concern, right. you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it does serve people maybe even beyond the uh, oh for sure the I mean, North Clackamas Park. So would you recommend to change this language to beneficial services to all community members? Community to the broader, to, to our broader community members, or something that really definitely makes it clear it's not just Milwaukee. Um, could you say members of the community? But that could still be interpreted right. as, since it's the Milwaukee Community Center, mm -hmm. the community can be interpreted as. How about residents throughout the region? Right. So work? Absolutely. Right. So I have provide essential beneficial services to residents throughout the region. Thank you. Anything else? Good catch. Then I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the resolution changing the name of the Milwaukee Center to the Milwaukee Community Center as amended by staff. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the resolution changing the name of the Milwaukee Center to the Milwaukee Community Center uh, as. <laughs> what did you say? As amended by staff. As amended by staff. Thank you. Wow. All right. Great. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And inherited passes in the next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Oak Lodge Water Services District check in. And this will be uh, presented by the district's engineer, uh, Jason Rice, and other members of the district. Jason, for those of you that don't know, used to be our city. Which is why we're all going to vote against this right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, You're out of here. Hello, Mayor Gam, back and fellow councilors. I'm Paul Barnett, the president of the Oak Lodge Water Services Board of Directors. To my right is Mark Knudsen, the board treasurer, and as introduced, Jason Rice. Um, the Oak Lodge Board of Directors has expressed a desire to actively pursue changing the governance structure of the district to an authority. This initially had been discussed at the time of the uh, <coughs> consolidation of the water and sewer districts, but was deferred for the sake of simplicity. Since that time, we've been approached by some community members that have asked the board to consider this change in governance. And the board has discussed it and believes that a change in governance will improve our ability to plan for our future capital improvements, protect the integrity of our existing investments, 
and limit the risk of losing a portion of our customer base through annexation or incorporation. If the district were to lose a portion of our customer base, then uh, <clears throat> due to withdrawal and the existing bonded debt and needed improvements would be spread over fewer customers and necessitate rate increases, of course. To meet the statutory requirements of becoming an authority, we will be asking the Board of County Commissioners to start the process. But since the border of our district extends into both uh, the corporate city limits of Milwaukee and Gladstone, the statutory process requires that the cities express their approval by resolution. An alternate method would be for us to redraw our district boundaries and shrink them so that we're not overlapping into the cities, but then that would require us to redo all the intergovernmental agreements to serve the customers that we're currently serving that are within the, the two cities. Our, our master planning processes uh, for drinking water, sanitary sewer, and stormwater services show the need for substantial investments going forward. Um, a recent water master plan showed a need for about $31 million to be spent over the next 30 years. And we're just starting the sewer master plan and we expect recommendations for additional capital investments in that area as well. Uh, forming an authority will provide a governance structure that aids our long-term planning by forestalling removal of portions of our customer base and helps protect our investments in those systems, which ultimately benefits the entire community. Um, we value the relationships we have with both cities and we establishing IGAs in a benevolent manner as uh, we worked well together in, in doing that in the past. We have mutual <clears throat> interests in the areas near our borders where the topography kind of drives which service provider can offer the service at the least cost for both the improvements and operations. We're currently looking at an intertie between our system and Milwaukee's that'll assist in both of our resiliency by enabling transmission of water in either direction, which would be nice to have this summer. And at this time, I'd like to have Jason show some slides that will show where our district overlaps with the city of Milwaukee and the numbers of customers we have in common. Hello, Holly. Oh, well, uh, oh, oh you've got it here. So you can take the next slide. A couple, <laughs> couple slides okay. here. Um, so yeah, I just try to do a big picture. We're talking about the southern boundary of Island Station to our district. Uh, even north of Park Avenue, for those of you that know what Park Avenue is, Park and Ride. And then the next slide kind of zooms in a little bit and shows various different customer classes that we've uh, identified. There, we currently have an IGA that takes care of these customers and how we translate the money back and forth between each monthly rate. Effectively, we collect your rate and reimburse you for those customers in which you provide services to, and you do the same for us. So we don't we don't currently need another IGA. We have it taken care of, but this kind of just shows the complexity of what's going on here and that sometimes a property may or may not be in your city limits. Sometimes it may or may not be being served by you for water or sewer, and there's combinations of all three of those. So the next slide actually just shows how many different properties we're talking about. And Peter, while he and I were going through this exercise, had a really good idea to just sort of take a step further and talk about which properties might uh, might develop and where their, uh, their services would come from after that development occurred. So we've actually gone through that exercise, assuming not building any new infrastructure where those properties would go to for their services, whether they're in your city or within our district. The IGA would take care of that. So lots of different examples, uh, only three properties that uh, have yet to be served by both water and sewer and they're in the middle. Uh, but yes, our proposal is to maintain the existing boundary in which we currently exist. 
so that it wouldn't change any of these customer classes. So, yeah. so next step, uh, we'll be returning to your city council next month to uh, request adoption of a resolution supporting this. As I understand, our district council has been in contact with Milwaukee City Attorney to begin preliminary tweaking of the language for that. So I'm not sure that, how soon that will be ready. They have concurred. Okay. They concur? Uh, yeah, they they are they will have it ready for We'll have it ready. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're be happy to entertain any questions you have. I, I did before oh. I have one last thought. I, in our preliminary conversations, I know there were a lot of questions related to well, how would this affect the corporation effort or potential annexation strategy? So we've had a couple of conversations with Joseph Edge and the various leaders of the Oak Lodge Governance Project and discussed that. And that the feedback that we've received from them, I mean, very explicit, was we think that the district should do whatever the district believes is in the best interest of its customers. And we truly feel that that is this authority to be able to preserve the certainty of planning that we need to do to be able to go forward. It doesn't compromise the ability to form the city. And, and the governance project has been very outspoken in terms of support of the district, in terms of continuing to exist as a district, regardless of what happens with the corporation in the Oak Lodge area. So I think we're actually have very compatible goals in terms of trying to achieve this and, and how this proposal fits into that framework in the future. Questions? What I, I guess I'm I'm not really very familiar with the timeline on when that project should wrap up and have some sort of a recommendation or, or at least we'll have a better understanding about which direction that might go. We, um, they're getting a final document from, what is it, Eco Northwest they're working with? Correct. Uh, I think in September. Um, they've seen a draft um, and based on the draft they concur that this um, in no way hampers uh, their ability to to form a city or to or any of the options actually that they're considering. So um, So I mean the questions on the table are incorporation, annexation, do nothing. Right. So I, I suppose I would still maybe I guess have questions about well then what if it's annexation then we've got Milwaukee residents who have very different governance structure for for the same services. So right, guess, which you know, we already do have. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, what it, in, in practicality, uh, it's my understanding, is let's say that we were to vote no and, and we decide we're not going to do this. All it means is that, that Peter and these guys are going to have to jump through a bunch of hoops to change who's served by what and all these things. It's just going to cost a bunch of money and the service to those people, their lives won't yeah. look really any different. They'll still have water and sewer. Um, it doesn't, to my understanding, really affect our bottom line or our functioning of our systems in any way. Uh, and things like the inner tie are always good, right? It's always good to have the redundancy. Uh, I'm actually, under that, I was curious, where, what is your source? I don't even know. We draw off the Clackamas River. Okay. Yeah, uh, we share a treatment plant with Sunrise and Gladstone. Okay, that's what I figured. Maybe you guys have wells too. Uh, we do not. Okay. And I just guess I want to make it super clear that at least for me personally, you know, I'm very agnostic on what the Oak Grove Jenny Laws residents <laughs> decide to do and what path they take. I guess I'm my question is just a little a little bit more about sort of like you know any additional complications or yeah. you know any potential future of residents not suggesting in any way that I have. The skin of that game, or, or put my finger on the outcome. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do hope that they become incorporated in some manner. I think uh, unincorporated, large unincorporated urban areas are a bad idea. Yeah, uh, I 
certainly share that concern in terms of specifically their schedule. My understanding is they haven't been particularly clear because they're kind of figuring it out as they go along. And I, I don't and I don't mean to be material about it because it's a very complex process. Yeah. And so the work that they're doing right now is gathering the information, particularly related to the economics, how much would it cost for the three options that you've identified. And then I, they've been very committal in terms of then sharing that information with the public, having a public dialogue and input, asking questions, hopefully finding the answers to address those concerns, and then figuring out, okay, based on that, where do we go from there? And so I think they are working their way along the process, but in terms of a, they're going to have a final decision by X, I don't think that exists at this point. Okay. And so that's why we feel like, well, we need to move ahead and make this decision and then wait for the governance project to figure out what their ultimate outcome is going to be. Thank you. And I'll just add that the mayor and I had the opportunity to meet with these folks and with uh, Peter Pass earlier, public works director, and um, I really appreciated that you all reached out and that, that we had that broader conversation and it, it felt really good to me. Uh, it still feels really good to me. Uh, I feel like you are acting in the, the best interests of your your customers, and I think at that time in that meeting, I said the best the best outcome is one where nobody notices anything has happened. Um, you know, we don't want people noticing their their uh, water services. Generally, that's a bad thing. Um, and I do feel like that's clearly what you are endeavoring to do here. And, and that you've had really positive and clear communication with our public works folks. Um, so, so thank you for that transparency and openness. And um, yeah, I, I would support moving forward. Other questions? I guess my only other question would just be to get a head nod from Peter that he still thinks it's yeah. fine and good. Absolutely. Makes sense. All right. Well, I think, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Get a lock out a resolution and be back before you in a month or so. Perfect. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you very much. Thank Good evening, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next item of discussion is the municipal broadband. And this will be presented by our information technology manager, Brian Gill. Good evening. Oh, I need to talk louder. I'm not used to hearing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Good evening. Um, so I'm here to talk about municipal broadband. It's been something that's been kind of hanging out there for a while. And quite honestly, it's kind of a scary topic for an IT person because it's not something that we normally do. Uh, so I reached out to Hillsborough and Sherwood who have been uh, putting municipal broadband out to their residents quite successfully. And I asked them, you know, is there a paint by numbers that we can follow? And they said, not really, but we have a great person to talk to, and that's John Honker. Uh, he is with Magellan, um, I'm not sure what, Magellan something that starts with an A. Advisors. Advisors, yes, and I have him here. <laughs> so oh, oh, almost, almost here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, John is helping out Sherwood and Hillsborough, like I said, and um, subject matter expert to go ahead and do a presentation for you, and then answer any questions that you may have, um, and then we'll we'll move on from there. Great, thanks. Welcome. Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Mayor and members of City Council. Uh, pleasure to present tonight to. Uh, to leadership in uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, my name is John Honker. I uh, uh, am actually one of the founders of Magellan. Uh, we've been around for about 17 years now, uh, helping cities across the country uh, figure out the broadband issues that they have and uh, and find fixes for them, find resolutions for them. Um, we work across the U.S. and, of course, most closely with your neighbors, Sherwood and Hillsborough. Um, as they are both deploying their uh, fiber optic networks to provide internet services to their communities. Uh, we've been working with Hillsborough for about four years, 
uh, helping them design and build the network. So we have local staff in, in Hillsborough who are on site every day uh, with the fiber construction contractors. We really are the city's um, an owner's rep, right, for the city. We're helping manage and protect the city's best interests as the network's being built uh, and make sure that the residents are getting services on time and on on par and on the uh, on delivery, they're getting the best services they can. Uh, we're doing the same with Sherwood, and Sherwood is just going into construction of its network here in the in the next uh, few months. So, so we do we work heavily across the U.S. Um, this is a very big topic, and it's a very important topic, as you all have seen. Uh, if we want to move on to the next slide, Brandon. Um, COVID, you know, we all know that internet service is important in our community, but COVID really became the catalyst that almost was a wake-up call. And it was a wake-up call for so many cities across the U.S. that realized some of their customers or some of their citizens and businesses didn't have adequate access to internet and didn't have equitable access to internet as well. Um, and that became, you know, that's become a, a major issue and a major charge. As you have probably heard, you know, there's over $65 billion of federal funding that's been allocated toward broadband in the CARES Act and the uh, American Rescue Plan, which is being funded across the U.S. and being used for, for broadband. So, you know, what we've seen in, as a result of this, and you've probably heard this in your community as well, is, you know, as, as people were driven home uh, and to shelter in place and to work from home and live and, and, and thrive from home, you know, internet networks were taxed and internet service providers didn't always stand up to the challenge of meeting their customers' demands. Um, and we found that, you know, there were significant issues in terms of working from home, and the economic development uh, cost of that, right, in terms of both keeping home-based businesses thriving and alive on the internet, and also allowing remote workers to be able to do their jobs. Uh, we saw major issues across the U.S. with education and virtual learning, right? Work from uh, learn from home environments. We saw so many school systems struggle, and with that came, you know students who are falling further and further behind the curve. Uh, and this was a really significant equity issue we saw in many communities where you know, those who had sufficient broadband had, had high-speed internet that was very reliable and affordable you know, would do well, whereas those who didn't fell behind and didn't have that access. So digital equity, digital uh, inclusion has just become a very, very big topic and very important to the, uh, the you know our, our students, our kids, our work from home. Healthcare and telemedicine, another major in, impact from COVID, being able to have those virtual doctors visits and be able to actually you know uh, televisit with them. Um, public safety and first responders having internet access to be able to manage the pandemic as a, a public institution, and then uh, like I said before, digital equity and digital literacy, making sure that. Uh, you know, through COVID that, you know, inter internet uh, access was available and for those that had it, it was, you know, it was their lifeline to the rest of the world. Next slide, please. So, so really the problem is, as, as we see it and what's important to you to think about as we, as you start to, to, to um, consider broadband and the role possibly that the city of Milwaukee should play in broadband, um, think about some of these questions, right? Do residents and businesses have equal access to high-speed internet? Um, and when you think about that, are they, you want to know, understand whether they're, how they're distributed throughout Milwaukee, and also that your mileage may vary depending on where you live. And we've seen this in many communities. We saw this in Hillsborough. We also see it in Sherwood. Depending on where you are, there's different, not necessarily different types of service, but depending on how far you are away from a provider's network or a provider's central office, your, your services may be faster or slower, right? If you're at the end of the block versus the beginning of the block, closer to, the, to that uh, network access point, you may not have as, as uh, 
uh, reliable or as fast as service. But the second thing that you should be thinking about is do residents and businesses have a choice? Right? Do more, does more than one option exist for them in terms of high speed networks, right? in terms of high speed internet? In some cases, only one provider is available. And we see this in most communities around Portland where there's a, uh, you know, obviously a dominant cable provider and, and then a, a, a traditional telephone company that's offering DSL. But are those services on par and can you get both of those services at high speeds in, to each household in the community? And finally, are prices affordable given the limited providers that are in the environment? When consumers have alternatives, providers have to compete on price. And this is one of the big things that, that you want to really think about when you're considering high-speed internet and the needs of the community. Is there, an, is there a competition in Milwaukee so that prices are affordable um, and people are getting what they pay for? Um, we've seen this already starting to happen in Hillsborough, where because of the city service, you know, the other providers are jockeying and maneuvering to reduce their prices to be more competitive with Hillsborough's pricing. So when we think about some of these issues, you know, these are really core to the overall um, policy framework for broadband uh, in, a, in a community like uh, Milwaukee, and then from this, as we start to think about these, these issues, we want to advise you on what uh, other communities are doing throughout the U.S. Next slide, please. So why do cities provide all internet, right? Because there's a number of them that are, as you probably know, Sherwood and uh, Hills, uh, Hillsborough are both providing, are both ISPs, meaning they're both providing certain internet service directly to their homes and businesses across the city. Um, it's really about digital equity for residents and businesses, which means access and affordability, meaning equitable access to any home or business across the city and affordable access at the same rate. Um, economic development, retention of existing jobs and attracting new jobs. Low cost internet for economically challenged and vulnerable populations. Now we see this as a major um, push in terms of, of affordability to ensure that the you know, disadvantaged citizens are, have a lifeline type of an internet access at a very low cost uh, to, to allow them to you know, have those capabilities and, and thrive in the digital world. Cities also like to improve connectivity to schools, hospitals, libraries, you know, the utilities, and other public organizations. So as, for example, in, in Hillsboro, part of Hillsboro's highlight uh, internet uh, uh, service offering the city actually built a, a, a fiber network to connect all 34 Hillsborough City schools. And they all now have 10 gigabit connectivity, very, very high speed connectivity. And it was part of their total strategy to build uh, a digital uh, highway to not only connect their residents and businesses, but also the community anchor organizations that exist across the city. Um, what's a, this is another important aspect of it as you're thinking about the internet and thinking about fiber in general. Fiber has a great ability to support reliability and new capabilities for electric distribution. And we work with a lot of electric utilities across the U.S. and you know, they're really investing in fiber networks to expand their distribution automation and their, their, their smart grid programs in support of reliability and reducing cost. Um, and then also just generally supporting future needs as they emerge, because as cities build fiber networks, they find new purposes for them every day. Um, one of our customers in, uh, in California, uh, city of Palo Alto, has, has built, built a network like this 25 years ago, and only for the purpose of connecting some facilities together. Today, that network connects over 250 businesses, uh, connects all of the schools, the libraries, all of the, uh, basically all of the community anchors and generates about $4 million a year for the city. So when you think about fiber optics in general and fiber, think about it as core infrastructure, like your roads, your water, your sewer, your electric system. It's an asset that you're going to be, you're going to potentially be using 
for long-term uh, value and, and long-term revenue generation for this. Next slide, slide please. So who else is building and who else is in, the, in broadband in terms of municipal governments? Around 400 cities and counties nationwide. This map gives you a kind of a sh sh clustering effect of all the uh, cities uh, that are out there today that provide some kind of uh, broadband service to their communities. And they do this in a couple different ways. You can see in the Pacific Northwest between Oregon and Washington, even Northern California, there's a great concentration of uh, networks. And those are generally between the cities, uh, the public utility districts, and uh, a number of counties in, in the Pacific Northwest states. Um, if we move on to the next slide, this is important for you to think about just at a very high level. This is also a very big topic. You know, how would the city even consider uh, what role would the city play in the broadband arena? Um, in, in, in that map, 63 cities are the actual ISP, like Hillsboro and uh, uh, Sherwood. In another 286 cities, um, the city is providing what we call wholesale or just dark fiber, meaning that they're leasing the infrastructure. They, they own it, they own fiber and the actual network that connects residents and businesses, but they're, they're not providing the service. In that case, they're shifting those responsibilities to another provider or a partner who can, uh, can provide those cities. Uh, provide internet to those customers. And in 71 cities, the, an actual partner is the ISP, meaning a partner has come in, uh, either it co-invested with the city or um, part, uh, is using the city's uh, fiber infrastructure to provide services to homes and businesses. So these are just a couple of ways that the city, that the cities are, play a role in broadband. And I'll just now talk a couple of minutes about the two that are closest to you. Um, Hillsboro with Highlight, uh, the city's providing high-speed internet and digital voice to their, uh, their customer base. The network is uh, live, it's active. Uh, we uh, started designing it about uh, two years ago, it took us about nine months to uh, do all the engineering and, uh, and, and then go into construction of the first phases of the network, which are predominantly in the South Hillsboro area um, and uh, around Davis Road. Um, the city provides a service, provides customer service, um, sales, marketing, really all functions to deliver high-speed internet to their residents and businesses. Um, moving on to the next slide, Sherwood does the same. Sherwood uh, was, has been in the business for a, long, a longer time, uh, about seven years. Uh, but only to a smaller portion of the city. Now they're actually accelerating that time frame and are looking to build out citywide. Uh, and will be going into construction in the next probably 60 to 90 days uh, for the, the first phase of homes and businesses in the city. Like, like um, uh, Hillsboro, Sherwood also provides high-speed internet. They provide one gigabit uh, customer service, uh, local support, um, they have an internal staff that's actually managing that, has been managing that, and then will grow that staff over time as they get more customers and, and grow. Um, next slide, please. Um, others in the, uh, so uh, actually we can, we can go to the next slide. So um, that's really a high level of kind of framing out what you should be thinking about as leadership in terms of high-speed internet, how your community is served, and you know some potential strategies that the city could uh, utilize to um, resolve or uh, mitigate issues if they're found. So the, the first and the most important thing for you to do is really understand the facts, right? As you're starting to approach the broadband, uh, broadband as a policy issue. Um, and and uh, part of our next steps would be to really conduct a, what we call a feasibility study for you. And that feasibility study is going to would answer a number of questions around high-speed internet in Milwaukee. And it's really, the goal of it is to present the facts as they are. The facts of, and, and those, those facts will be 
uh, garnered through answering a number of questions. One, what's the current, current state of broadband in Milwaukee? What do uh, residents and businesses have? Uh, are those services sufficient? Are providers making investments in the community? And are the services up to par with your peer communities also? Right? Meaning, how is Milwaukee doing compared to some of its peers in the Portland area? How is it, uh, what role could the city play in broadband? Right? As we first understand what the current uh, state of broadband is in Milwaukee, and if we identify gaps and issues, then we look at what role the city could play in terms of you know, could active investment. Could the city make active investments in broadband, similar to what Sherwood and Hillsborough are doing? Uh, what would the costs of those investments be? Uh, are there ways to reduce those costs? You know, one of the key aspects that's different in Milwaukee um, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you have your own electric utility, um, I don't believe, and that would uh, significantly improve. We do not have our own electric. You don't, you don't have your, okay, you don't have your own electric utility. Thank you, Forest Grove. <laughs> okay, so then you would, you'd be on par as we look at really sort of the, the um, ways to reduce costs, any existing infrastructure that you have, any existing fiber, or um, other capital projects that may allow for simpler fiber construction, give you ways to reduce costs. And also, as we look at the opportunities, um, one of the key things that you'll want to understand is how many citizens and businesses would actually subscribe to services if um, if Milwaukee were to, pro to provide uh, uh, an, an internet service. And then finally, what are the benefits and risks, right? This is probably the most important as you, as you consider what the role of Milwaukee is in the broadband arena, you know, you want to look at what the benefits are to the community. You know, how are the residents empowered? How are your businesses and economic development empowered? Um, look at, we'll look, we want to look at all of those different community functions that you support and how broadband really becomes a, uh, a, a, a platform to help them thrive and also innovate. Conversely, we also have to look at the risks, right? What, you know, the, these are, uh, you know, network, networks are expensive, right? And, and, and the, the costs of infrastructure are high. Um, you know, to derive those benefits. So we need to really look at the risks because as, you know, Hillsborough and Sherwood go into, into the business, but they have to compete with providers um, and uh, other cities that are also in the business have to compete with those providers are, as well. And you want to understand what the risks in doing that are, right? How, how would you, and how you would potentially overcome them. So the back half of the study will really look at the financial analysis in terms of the costs, a number of different business models that the city could implement, both business models where the city is actively providing service and business models where the city is more of a, just a passive owner of infrastructure. But we always use roads as a good example, right? Meaning that the city builds the roads, but and commerce happens on the roads, but the, the, the city doesn't drive the cars. So the city doesn't make the commerce happen. It's just an enabler. So when we think about the business models, there'll be those active models where the city is the, the ISP, which gives you, you know, the most reward, the most control, but also has risk, more risk associated with it, versus those more passive models that may allow the city to, to divert some of that risk. Although, by doing that and potentially having another provider uh, deliver those services to residents, you're also taking away some control. So there's a, there's a delicate balance between risk, reward, and control as you consider these different options in, in how you, uh, you want to, um, what role you want to play in broadband. So uh, these are really kind of the, the essential questions that we want to help you answer in the study. And um, again, it's a large, this is a significant topic, and, and I want to kind of keep this presentation short, but I would, I would love to take some Q&A if, uh, if any uh, a mayor or a member of council has any, any questions for us. I definitely do. I have a few. Um, I was a little surprised by your slide that showed um, how few of them actually operate their own ISP and that the bigger majority are the sort of wholesale providers. Um, 
are they providing to existing, you know, typical ISP, you know, typical providers like cable companies and phone companies, or are they using some non, not-for-profit models? Are they typically providing to for-profit providers? It's, a, it's actually, a, that's a great question, thank you, and, and it's a combination. So, you know, in, in those 71 uh, instances where a city is providing service, there's actually more because in some cases there's a city and there's a nonprofit um, subsidiary or there's a nonprofit community organization that's actually delivering the service, uh, so the city doesn't have to, right? And in some cases, in some states, um, you know, Oregon's different, of course, right, where, where the city can provide services, but in some states, they have to do it that way because the city itself, the municipal corporation, isn't allowed to provide service, so they do it through a third party. So the, the numbers aren't quite as black and white as, as that slide showed. There's, it's probably closer to 150 where the cities, if we include the nonprofits, it's probably about 150 total. Uh, where the city's providing service. And it's been a while since I looked at Sandy, Oregon's um, page, but as I recall, they were providing the service for 40 to $50 a month. 59 for gigabit and 29 for 100 megabyte. Is that what it is? Okay. Okay. Is That's that- That's pretty competitive. That's pretty competitive. It's very competitive. It are, is that similar to what's coming out in Hillsboro and Sherwood, or are those coming in those, more expensive? Those are a little more expensive, but they do have a low income option that's significantly lower than that. But I don't remember the price. Do you, do you remember the low income price in Hillsboro? John? Um, I, you know, Councilor, I'm, I, I believe it's 19 or 29. Um, I know that, that uh, Hillsborough, they were working on the pricing recently, so don't please don't quote me on that. I don't know if it was set in stone, but, but that's kind of what I recall. I mean, another good example, we, we see a lot of cities who are providing service. Good example is like Longmont, Colorado, who's one of the kind of the premier um, providers in the in the state, they they offer a, a one gigabit service for fifty dollars a month, lifetime membership, and they actually started with that because they wanted to get as many people to sign up as possible and, and really get a head start. Um, and now they have almost 58, 59 percent of the population subscribes to the service, and then they also have a low income option, which is I think nineteen ninety nine uh, for their for the service. So they took a, a very you know, if you reduce the prices, you're going to get more subscribers. Right? They, they took that approach and uh, were able to get the volume, and they provide to about 40, 35 to 40,000 homes across uh, 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 that community in Colorado, which is just a little bit north of Denver, about uh, an hour and a half. So I'm paying, I believe, $50 a month right now for fiber. And uh, we're talking about a whole lot of work for what effectively amounts to possibly a $30 savings per month for our lower income residents. Um, if we wanna save people 30 bucks a month, I hope we think about all of the different ways we could do that rather than focusing on broadband. Um, and I will absolutely, there are also benefits to small businesses to discredit that in any way. But I'm hoping that in this study, we will have some data that tells us about who in Milwaukee has a, de has a decent internet connection right now and who doesn't. Who doesn't because they can't afford it and how much cheaper it might be for them. And then I hope we also have some sort of assessment of how much time and effort it will take the city of Milwaukee to take on an entire new service equivalent to roads or water or other infrastructure. Uh, I also have questions. At one point you mentioned revenue generation. Our roads do not generate revenue 
for us. Our water system does not generate revenue for us. We, we rely on those systems to be self-serving. So whatever we have around broadband has to be able to pay for itself. That's how government works. It's not a, mm -hmm. you don't make money off of it. No, but what we see in most communities is there's in, in the communities that are providing services themselves, they're gener they are generating excess revenues. So they're utilizing those either as a general fund contribution or they're operating as an enterprise fund and they're reinvesting those revenues back into expansion of the network or to reduce rates, right? Because in some cases they'll say, well, if we have excess money in the system at the end of the, in the fund balance at the end of the year, that should go back to the subscribers, right? Because it should be a zero, uh, it should pay for itself, but it shouldn't be a gen revenue generator. So, you know, municipalities use different ways to treat those revenues, whether they reinvest, whether they make contributions to the general fund, special projects. We have some municipal clients that will put those into a special projects reserve and use those for, you know, new, new construction facilities or, uh, or, or uh, provide rebates on broadband uh, fees. What I'm saying is I hope that we get some very good information out of this study that will help answer those questions that I raised about who's benefiting, how this is working, all of that. And glad to hear that it could be uh, a mechanism for subsidizing uh, lower income customers. That would be an important feature to know. Just this feedback to you, Brandon, and I know I'm probably asking for the moon because that's what we do. Um, <laughs> But that, that is part of what I hope to have as an understanding of what it would really mean to provide broadband services in Milwaukee. I do want, if this is something we undertake, it to be something that provides a, a significant benefit for uh, people in need and small businesses that are struggling. Well, and I think it's not just small businesses. It's the business, it's called for in our in North Milwaukee innovation area to increase the band, you know, to create, create a fiber network to support large businesses as well. And I'll have to find out where you're getting your service because I'm, I'm paying $110 a month for okay. broadband plus voice. So the, so I look at, at Hillsborough's rates online, they're saying 55 and I don't have a gig. I definitely do not have a gig coming to my house. They have $55 for one gig service, plus $20 for voice means $75. That's a, about, you know, 30, 40% reduction over what I'm paying for less service. So for those of you who don't know, Lisa and I are neighbors. We live about two blocks away. And I have a correction from my significant other that we're actually paying $65 a month for our fiber. Mm -hmm. But that is what we're paying. I pay 65 service also. Um, so I think that that will be really interesting though to learn from the study is, is what are the options available to Milwaukeeans. I'm interested in whether or not there are, you know, and it, we, we do low income, you know, pricing for, for all the services that we provide for the city and this would, you know, if we endeavor to do this, I'm sure we would do that as well. I guess I'm curious if there are even more creative pricing models that other cities might be using that are sort of sliding scale. Um, mm -hmm. You know, both in the in the residential and the commercial arena, uh, is that anything that anybody's doing, or is it just sort of like here's the rate, and then there's this discount rate? Um, you know, I I think there a lot of the cities will will rebate those depending on the level of income. So, you know, one good barometer that cities use is the free introductory school lunch program, and the long the length of time that customers have been in that program. So. You know, for long-standing customers, those rebates grow, or in some cases, they may be at free service, right? If it's a if it's a long-standing customer where it's a, 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 a sort of a, a year after year participation in the program, and then the city has to work with the school district for that, but it's 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 great data because you know everyone uses that as a baseline to judge. Uh, incomes and, and you know disadvantaged residents. So those discounts could become progressive all the way to zero for the most disadvantaged. Anybody else any questions or thoughts? I 
I have to say that I've been advocating for this since before I was the mayor. Um, I was privy to Sandy's process as that was going on and really impressed by what they pulled off. I know it's different. They didn't have high-speed internet in Sandy, period. Uh, but, you know, as we all learned the hard way this last year, the internet is virtually as important to people's lives as electricity. And uh, there are lots of folks that can't afford what the, what the internet providers are currently charging. And so we, we do have a dark fiber system that runs throughout Milwaukee. Uh, and so if, if we can create a service that gets our uh, residents a better service for less money, uh, I'm all for it. And it doesn't necessarily mean the city's the provider. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Because there are nonprofit models yep. to look at. Yep. And I also just wanted to add, we are using ARPA funds in order to pay for the study. We do not actually have the resources after the study for the implementation, but we are trying to make sure that we at least have the information we need in order to start making future decisions as a city. It sounds like we've got some, a lot of really great ideas and questions in particular, and I think that we better get that list to you sooner rather than later so that we're not sitting here dissecting the study with all the questions we wish had been answered. <laughs> and then, John, how long does the study usually take? Typically, the, these studies are you know, five to six months. Um, we would anticipate, based on the current schedule, you know, around the end of the year would be about the timing for uh, for completion of your study, We, you know, given the size of uh, Milwaukee. Uh, and just our familiarity with the area as we look at costing, uh, and uh, and the, the you know construction costs and things like that, uh, we we think it'll be completed by the end of the year. In the report, um, the staff report, uh, keep called out Brandon that another option for the city to consider is a community outreach effort through a survey to determine how residents would consider and or take advantage of a broadband service, and that that would both increase the cost and increase the amount of time to complete the survey. Um, so I just wanted to see if we could have a little discussion about whether or not that was something that we wanted to ask of our staff. Um, I, so I was, was going to ask that if you didn't. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I, I do. That's OK. Uh, I do. More information is better. Feasibility of this is going to be very dependent on how interested uh, the folks that live in Milwaukee are in having this service. So, um, although the timeline is a drag, um, I think the more information we have, the better. If we add something like that, is will we still be able to meet federal requirements for the expenditure of ARPA dollars? Yeah, we've got. Aren't we due to do? do to perform <laughs> our community survey. We do that every two years. We are. It's in, in December, December or January. It's good. Yeah, it'll be December or January. So you're suggesting maybe that's it should a rule without provided. having to do a separate survey? Right. We, I mean, we could add some questions to the community survey. I thought we conducted it in October or November, and then we get the report December January. So with Kelly not being here, I am not allowed to actually add any I tried doing that today to the survey, but I'm happy to take this back and look at it with Brandon. And it might just be a way to streamline it. Yep. We're already paying someone to do that representative sampling. I will say it's not, it's certainly not an official um, survey, but I see it's one of the things I most commonly see complaints about on nextdoor.com is the lack of uh, and the quality of internet service providers available in this area. It's a very common complaint. Um, so I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll uh, see people who are interested. I am too. John, did you have any comments on the uh, the survey portion? 
Um, Brandon, you know, I think I think the survey would would be valuable for. I mean, it's always valuable, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, you as leadership should understand what the citizens and businesses have to say about broadband, and not only understand it, but also get a good quantitative sampling and, and get good statistical val statistically valid information that you can make the decisions on from the residents. And I think that, you know, in Milwaukee where you have some fiber already and you have some competition, it would be very helpful to understand what the residents are thinking and what their preferences are because it's not all, always about speed, right? And sometimes it's about reliability, sometimes it's about customer service. And you really want to understand what the complaints as, as, um, as uh, the council member had mentioned, what kind of complaints people really have in, in uh, Milwaukee. And that gives you the facts and how then to resolve those problems and if if there's a, a feasible path forward and if so what, what what is that feasible path so I, I think the voice of the community would be very valuable and if you can integrate it into the community survey um seems like a great opportunity to do that i um i one question we would ask would just be you know how much content could go into that survey um if it's adding into the existing survey right <laughs> That, that is the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I would I would ask if we are going to do a, a community survey. And it sounds like we are leaning toward that. That we really do try and collect some information about who's being impacted by what and how, specifically with regard to equity concerns around income levels and what people are paying, what they can afford to pay, um, those sorts of issues that I already covered in my, my earlier. Because I think this is an opportunity for us to get a better understanding of that. And I would really appreciate that. All right. So I guess I'm looking for a recommendation. And from what I hear, it's the feasibility study with the survey to go along with it. All right. That's perfect. That'll take about how long does the survey? It's about a year course, right? You were saying, John, with the. Uh, if we do the feasibility study and the survey? Oh, I, I think we can get it done in maybe just a little bit more time. I mean, oh, we, okay. because we can, we, we can do the survey, we can uh, have parallel tasks, the survey with the rest of the feasibility study going on at the same time. The costing, the design, you know, the benefits, all of that. So I think um, you know, we may push into six to seven months from five to six, but I don't, I don't see a major extension uh, if we add the survey. Um, and, and let, uh, I, I don't know what the time frame was for the, the community survey, though. If it was going out December, if, you know, we would be contingent on that time frame. If we did a separate survey, we could keep it to sort of six to seven months. So we'll just follow your guidance on which you, we, uh, you guys think would be best. Well, and I will say that I think that in the community survey, we won't get the depth of information I would want us to get. So I actually would think for having it be a standalone. Yeah, it sounds like the community survey would suffer. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I concur. Sure. Yeah, you really want to have good statistical information, and our our, our surveys are generally about twenty five questions or so, yeah. and you know they're they're, they're staged <laughs> to really give you a solid understanding of, of demand in the community, um, resident needs, and also something that's bulletproof, so that you know there's very you know, if you only have a few questions, there can be a lot of rocks thrown at that survey and a lot of attacks and, you know, to try to uh, discredit it. Um, we really just try hard in our surveys not to let that happen, right? Very statistically valid, removing bias, asking the right questions, setting up the questions correctly. So uh, we think that's going to give you the best, the best results and the ones that you can stand behind in the study. And would you like to see the survey before it's sent out? or you just want to see the results of the survey? If you bring it back to us, that's just going to take I actually, I also think it could lead to the questions being biased, and so I would rather actually have it done. Yeah. Okay. okay. We don't do this professionally. Yep. I no, mean, I certainly don't. Yeah. <laughs> but I do want to make sure that we see, um, you know, a little bit more of the data on the, that, um, is, you know, the 
underlying data. I think sometimes we kind of see a little bit of too, too big a picture and not enough. Yeah, it'd be great to see more uh, granular results. Yeah, yeah we can do it. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. All right. Well, thank you. That was a great presentation. And we look forward to seeing the results of both the study and the survey. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. And Mayor, before we go into our next topic, I did actually want to make an introduction because I didn't know who was come up uh, in the audience. So Michael will come up. Michael is Michael Bork is the main head of NCPRD. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. This is his third day. Third day, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank yeah, and I just wanted to come and observe uh, and, and see how things function. Thank you for the uh, great bumps at the beginning of the meeting. I appreciate it. Sure. And uh, yeah, just wanted to be able to put faces to names and uh, see what you guys do. So thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for sitting here and doing what you okay. appreciate. Thank you. Sure. Or like, yeah. Okay. We're going to take a quick five minute break and then we'll be back with the council bowl discussion. All right, we are back on air, um, and our next and I believe last topic is a uh, continuation of goal setting for the council. Um, I want to give a little bit of introduction to folks that are watching, watching and, and maybe a, a, a little more nuanced explanation of the process. Uh, the Milwaukee City Council sets typically three goals, uh, which are things that we uh, have extra funding and put extra work towards. Um, and the goal of the goals is to put in place a process, generally, unless it's a one-off thing that we can do quickly, uh, to put in place a process that becomes self-funding and then that work just continues. The perfect example of that is our SAFE program uh, that is ongoing. We are continuing to build sidewalks and bike paths and safe crossings and all those things and we'll be doing that over the next probably nine years. Um, and it is no longer a council goal, but that work continues. It doesn't stop just because it stops being a council goal. The, the intent of the goals is to get a process going and either complete it or to set in motion a self-funding process that will continue that work. That said, uh, when we spoke about uh, uh, no longer having housing be a goal, uh, the only thought there is that some folks feel like we have uh, some self-funding for that and that can continue. We have several processes in motion that will continue over the next several years. Um, it in no way, shape or form, indicated that we were going to be removing any affordable housing from anywhere. Uh, we are in the process of, of creating a great deal of affordable housing and over the next several years we will see uh, at least 500 new units of affordable housing. So this, this conversation was never about removing any affordable housing nor stopping the construction of future affordable housing. I just want everybody to be super clear on that because we got some emails that were really disturbing. All right, so the question then at hand is what are going to be our three goals going forward? In the last session we established that uh, because we have just really uh, embarked on our equity uh, and justice goal that, that we are going to continue with that until, again, it is a self-sustaining process that is completely baked into the city that everything we do will be done through that lens and through that effort. 
Uh, we also continued with the climate goal uh, and said that over the next two years, we would endeavor to find a funding mechanism so that work can continue unabated uh, going forward in the future because clearly um, we're not going to be done solving the climate crisis in two years. So we will need people, uh, not only in our city, but every bloody where, to be working on uh, stopping climate change. So that's our intent on climate, is to uh, continue the work we're doing, forward it, and figure out a way to create a self-funding mechanism so that that work just continues on in the future, becomes a department in the city, just like the police, just like the library, just like public works. Uh, so the question that's on the table tonight is, do we keep housing as a goal to further even more work than is already going to be occurring? Or do we look at another goal? And I think the goal that, the secondary goal that we were considering uh, is parks. And I will explain that a little bit. We are in the process of trying to get Milwaukee Bay Park built. We have been working on this for 25 years, I think, and the city itself has invested uh, well north of $4 million in the process. Uh, we have gotten grants, we've done construction, we've done work out there, and uh, our parks district uh, stated intent was to finish the park um, which is now, the current design is something like $9.6 million. Uh, it was their intent to get that finished in the next few years. So that's one piece that's on the table. And they're getting the leadership, not the staff at NCPRD. But the county board of commissioners is getting a little squirrely about that project. Which you can read about in the Clackamas Review, two, yes. two articles recently. Yeah. Um, so that's one little piece of it. Another piece of it is during uh, the last year, there was federal money that came down to the state that was then divided out to the various state senators and representatives uh, to utilize in their districts. Um, both our state senator, Kathleen Taylor, and our state representative, Karen Power, uh, have committed funds, I think we're at 2.5 million? 2.25. 2 2.25 million dollars that are predominantly going to the build out of three of our neighborhood parks. Land that the city purchased quite some time ago and that are basically lawns at this point with a few trees. Um, so the interest is in getting those parks built out and then the question of how those will then be maintained because uh, whether or not NCPRD will be willing to maintain them. So parts has become an issue that we are going to have to address more robustly than we have been uh, in recent years, and that is why it's risen to the level of question as to whether that should be a council goal this year. I think so, the only thing I would add, maybe, to that explanation just going, you know, back to sort of generally goals. What we, you know, what we discussed last time is that, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, things that we, you know, establish a funding source that makes them sustainable. It's they're also can be policy driven. Sure. And so writing policy and creating an environment in which, you know, other things that can happen. Right. Right. And, and housing is a is a very good example. Of very good example of that because there are, while we are not a housing service provider. Uh, we do have a number of levers we can pull to affect how uh, housing service providers that provide low-income housing and uh, commercial developers engage with the city uh, and, and perhaps we can affect the affordability of even uh, commercial housing by changes in our policy. So that's that's really what's on the table is, is, are there more things that we need to do in the policy realm 
uh, to ensure that we have pulled every lever we can pull to make sure that we have as much affordable housing in a variety of spectrums, but the hardest one, of course, is, is the lowest income folks, housing that they can afford, given that uh, wages have not remotely kept up with the cost of housing. I don't know if any of you caught it, but two weeks ago, I think it was, Street Roots actually did a great article, again, on uh, the cost of housing and its increase and the relative uh, wages. And in the Portland metro region in particular, housing has, you know, rents in particular, have gone up substantially faster, double uh, what, what uh, incomes have gone up in those ranges, those price ranges. So it is not a problem that's even remotely solved, uh, and nor will we be able to utterly solve it, but we can certainly um, make a difference. We can make it easier uh, and less expensive to develop housing here in Milwaukee. So that is the table properly set. Well, I would just add, I mean, I think that's sort of where we ended last time. I would just add that I still feel that Kellogg Dam removal is, is something we should be thinking about and that we are at a juncture uh, where we're not going to be ready. We're going to, there's going to be federal funding and we're not going to be ready. Um, and I think that would be a real tragedy. Um, but I won't belabor that point because I did not uh, convince enough people. But I think, I think it's going to be, <laughs> I, I will have an I told you so moment at some point, I'm afraid. Um, I think that we have demonstrated um, that, that all of us think that Kellogg Dam should be removed and that we support those efforts that, that, that now, when, when we talked about this when I was first on council, the question was who should be the champion of that goal? Mm -hmm. And we immediately identified someone else. And Nikki Wick has really done, and I'm not saying- I don't remember that, that conversation that, at all. That we, that I, well then we'll have to look at the record because I remember specifically I remember. saying like, who should be the champion of this? And are we in the best position or is someone else in the best position? And we determined at that time that we were not in the best position to I be have champion. I have absolutely no recollection of a conversation like that. I do think Mickey Wick luckily has a director the last couple of years who has the capacity to have really moved that ball. Um, not something that the organization had more more than two years ago. Um, but there and, and on advocacy and on um, you know the political stuff, they can be a big player. But we need an engineer at the table. We need a somebody who will run, you know, we will have to run, as Kelly said last time, um, if, if there's a, um, you know, if there's an RFP to redo the lake bed, that will be on us because we're the property owner. So there are all these pieces that I don't know that it needs a full-time job. I'm not saying it needs a full-time staffer the way we have for climate and the way we have for equity, but it needs more staff time than we've been giving it and that, then that Kelly has bandwidth to give it. And I think it needs an engineer in particular. I, mean, I think Neil laid out some of those needs in his letter to us. What was the what was the dollar figure that we that we contributed to the uh, to the match? Twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand. So yeah. right. Yeah, that's to the study that's and it, and that was a good catalyst. I mean that got helped him get the rest of the money. That was a very that was a great step. But that's just one tiny piece of. I just have to point out that when we speculate on what staff time is required, we are not the experts in the room. And I have consistently, and I have spoken with staff about this numerous times, heard that it is going to take a lot of time and effort, dedicated time and effort from staff. So I appreciate the, the hope that it would just be an engineer's time some of the time, but, but that is, I, I think it is unrealistic. And what I'm hearing from staff is that we have serious capacity issues. Uh, I appreciate that this is important. I hope that 
we see some federal dollars come our way. Uh, the federal infrastructure package ended up even smaller than we were initially thinking it might be when we were talking about it at JPAC a few months ago. We were told to prepare for an $800 million package as the small version. Now we're down to 500 and change, which sounds like a lot of money, but in terms of what we need in terms of infrastructure in this country, it is almost insulting. So I, and I wish, I wish I had something different to say there. I wish we had a different outcome on that, but it did not make me feel terribly optimistic about federal dollars coming to rectify the very expensive mess that is the Kellogg. And I absolutely appreciate that we have so much dedicated advocacy out of Mickiewick. They're doing tremendous work. I can't thank Neil enough for his persistence. Um, and if anyone can turn the tides on this thing, I think he's the one. Um, so and, and I, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I want to be proven wrong, but right now, I, I do not look at our federal dollars and feel like we are set up to be in, in a missed opportunity here. I feel like we're seeing that the money's not there. And I know this is important to the community. I don't mean to diminish that at all, but I don't think there is a realistic understanding of how big the scope of work is on that project. And that we are not the primary well, we have always been. We, the the city led a process in 2011. No, I'm sorry. The ownership state. We don't own the ODOT is in such a is such a huge role. So is ODFW. Yes. So are so are federal partners. Yes. We are not the driver of removing Kellogg Dam. We can we can we could literally rewrite our entire budget and dedicate every single dollar of the city's budget to nothing but Kellogg Dam, and we still would be one seat at a huge table. That is my biggest concern with this project. It always has been. It's not because I don't want to see that dam gone. It's because we are we are one seat table. Even if we put ten people at that seat. Well, I mean ODOT, there's no there's no uh, you will hear no comment no uh, <laughs> No dissent from me that ODOT has to, you know, is, is the linchpin and getting ODOT to move is the linchpin. Um, but once that, I mean, the other people at the table are secondary. We are the second most important player at that table. We are the, the second. The quorum will have a lot to say, but yes. And, and, and it, again, like has sort of been said, if I saw any potential whatsoever, getting $22 million, we would be having a different conversation. I just, I don't. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, the, the current pack, I mean, the, the new package does not look promising. But that also doesn't sound like it's the last. Hopefully. Hopefully. I think, you know, we will see more over the coming year. And I think, you know, we will all be watching. We will all be working with our federal delegation this this not being a council goal doesn't take it away from things that we're trying to do as a council. That no, it just takes us in further from being ready. In. I think if it if, if there becomes a, a situation, I mean, what Neil's doing should get us enough of a study that should money become available, it can look like a shovel-ready pro project pretty darn fast. A little bit of that's dependent on ODOT, so more to come. So there's a new ODOT director. I was hoping to meet him at the OMA conference because we usually have a directors, we have all the directors there. They didn't do that this year. They're coming to LOC instead. So I will absolutely have a conversation with him about that and Monroe and a few other things that were involved with ODOT. Uh, and just to put it on his radar because he is I want to make sure that, that he is aware of it and how important it is to us. So it by no means takes it off the table for work that I'm going to be doing forward. And if, if we see any inkling that $22 million can be had 
then it's a whole new conversation. And there's something I, I feel like we haven't been saying in our discussion of why parks needs to be the goal. And that is that when we solicited those funds, those federal dollars from Senator Taylor and Representative Power, who were very generous uh, and really fought for those monies to come to our community, um, our commitment to them was that we would provide the staff time to manage that process. That means that the money that we're getting, the federal money, is not paying for the staff time that it takes to manage the process of building those three parks. That is a lot of work. We don't have a way to pay for that work. We don't make this a good And we could delay setting perks as a goal by six months, maybe a year, and still manage to pull it off. But we do not have another way to pay for the staffing we require to build out those three parks. I'll also add that that question that the mayor also already brought up about uh, ongoing maintenance for our parks. We have an already overburdened system. This is one of the lowest funded, if not the lowest funded, correct me if it's, you might remember as, better than As far that. as I know, it is the lowest funded okay. parks district in the state of Oregon. All right, so they're dirt poor. We keep asking more and more of them by adding more parks. And they, to their credit, try their hardest to deliver. But we are up against a funding crisis. And it's going to take some time from staff to figure out a way to pay for the maintenance of those new parks. And that will require staff time to do some research and education, both of us and for the public. I know it sounds bourgeois to go from talking about housing affordability to parks, but this isn't uh, airy fairy. This is a real situation that we have on our hands. And we, when we accepted that federal money, committed to holding up our part of the bargain with staff time and resources that we need to pay for. And one other thing I would say about parks is unlike the other two things on our, uh, you know, that we agreed to as goals, this one conceivably can be handled in two years. Yes. Right? Yes. We, we can work out on a Walk Bay Park. We will have designs and those new parks will be under construction in two years or close to construction in two years. Um, these are these are things that can be wrapped up in two years, unlike you know, affordable housing will be on there forever. Climate will be on there forever, you know. So um, I think that's the other thing to keep in mind, is that this is not setting something on to a goal that will necessarily, you know, it might even be done in less than two years. Who knows? Not to push. <laughs> but I do think it has a terminus. Yes. 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 When, we're, when we're saying it, I guess I'd like a little bit more information about what you think it is. We are not a parks district. We are not. So when you say we had a, we made a commitment, that commitment is, is to see the projects be built. I have, we, we are not having a conversation right now about forming a district. And we have IGAs for park maintenance, and those we know that we have ongoing conversations about those agreements. And we have been having conversations about, you know, Milwaukee Bay Park, and all of us have now, mayors going next week, all testified in front of the group of board of county commissioners. I would like to know a little bit more about what it is. So when we're talking about the commitment we made, it wasn't just to build them and turn them loose into the wild. It was to make sure that those parks are a functional part of the city. We know from the way our conversations are going around Milwaukee Bay Park, that there's a lot of reluctance on the part of this current board of commission, or, or county commission's board, however you want to say that, uh, to support our park system. So yes, there is an IGA in place that nominally might 
provide some basic, very basic, not up to our standards maintenance if we add three new parks. I do not think that it is likely we will get through talking about Milwaukee Bay Park without some demand being made. Um, I don't see a future where we're going to have um, an agreement with NCPRD that encompasses everything we've done in our portfolio when we had three new parks. I think they're going to push them. And I can't blame them. We're, we are adding work to the poorest district out there. Which often complains that it doesn't have enough parks. Yes, and that is unfortunate because it paints Milwaukee and Oak Grove as opponents when we are not. We are all in this together. We are all struggling with a deficit of funding for our park systems. Well, I think when we talk about goals, we need to be very clear about what our roles and capabilities are. And we are not starting a parks district. And that can't be part of this goal for the next two years, even. And that's basically what would be required for what, what you were talking about. No, no, to no. take the work away from the Parks District mm -hmm. and bring that work into the city. Well, then what is it? What are we talking about? How are, I mean, how are, explain to me what is, what is it? Not just the problem. We understand the problem. We understand that, that NCPRD is not funded well enough. We all acknowledge that. We understand that we've got some agreements that, that we need to work out with them. What does that mean? And we have some, you know, probably some financial obligations that come that will come with that. And it's, I mean, the it is nebulous. I think you're right, but there's, <laughs> there's, we don't know. Are we talking about? We don't know what the answers are. Of people for the city. So now we're just not. We're not just talking about one staff person to achieve this goal? Are we talking about hiring an entire maintenance group? I have no idea. I mean, that's part of the it, is figuring right. that out. That's why I said research. Well, education. talk about something that doesn't have an end date on it. <laughs> talk about something that literally is forever. That would be something. Oh, no. And hiring a whole crew to, uh, to well, take if that's the responsibilities if that's, that are parks district. Well, if that has, has to, to happen, then that has to come with funding. I mean, I wouldn't be here for, like, let's make that a goal and we make that, we fund that. I mean, that would have to come with a funding. We'd have to figure out a funding source. That's the it, not the hot, do we, you know. There's, there's just so many unknown variables. And to be perfectly honest, we don't know enough about where the board of commission so why can't i just say that correctly we don't know where the county is on this yet the park board is actually the hat board. that they're wearing yes thank you i should just say that too. but i want to be clear that it is our county commission that is at play here for folks who don't track that the parks board is the same thing same people. these yeah. are our commissioners that we we do not know where they're going to come down So we don't, and those negotiations are going to begin on August 12th. Um, we have been setting the stage for them with our testimony thus far, and we'll continue to do that on Thursday. Negotiations are beginning on August 12th? There we go. Okay. First I've heard that, okay. So what we, we no, you're talking about Milwaukee Bay Park. Milwaukee that's Park. one piece. That's, that's, that's not. That's the piece. Well, so Commissioner Savas has said that he not only needs this construction IGA to be agreed to, but he believes that we need our entire IGA uh, to be rewritten. Uh, we disagree. Uh, we think that the construction IGA is all that's required in this moment. Construction IGA they sent us is ridiculous. It includes all kinds of things way past construction. They have nothing to do with construction. They have to do with Happy Valley and their experiences there. So that's what begins on the 12th is the conversation. Uh, we will be sending them a red line version, which I think you all got to see, uh, of their contract that they sent us. And then on the 12th, we will be sitting down with them. That's their that conversation. It, by its nature, will not be the simple, straightforward construction of the because that's not what Paul wants. So our hope, 
we requested that a second commissioner be in the room because I personally believe that Paul is having one conversation with us and another conversation with this commission. And I need that commission to be aware of the reality of the conversation. Well, it was clear last week when Councilor Falconer and I went that, uh, I mean, the chair as much as said that Happy Valley is why they're, you know, that's the sure. motive, that's the motivator. Yeah, yeah. So, in any case, I think parks is going to be a moving target for a while. Uh, I think we are allowed to hire consultants for the parts, the, the um, design of the three neighborhood parks out of the ARPA money. And I think that gets us a pretty long way to do this, right? But you need staff to manage the consultant. No. Do we need a full-time staff to do that? I am not the person who can answer that question. Well, and it, I mean, it was the consultant for design process is one step, but there's also the construction, right? Sure. And there's, I mean, yeah, no, it's going yeah. to be a process. So but there I think are more roles. We've all experienced how long these processes take. They're not, if tomorrow we decide, okay, let's do this, we'll be damn lucky to be looking at designs a year from now. Well, how many years did it take to complete the, the Kellogg? The, the path. The Charlie Trail? The Charlie Trail. No, the path, but yeah, but through the Cronenberg, through oh, Cronenberg, no, sorry, yeah. next to Kellogg Creek. It's like 17? Like, I was thinking <laughs> Kellogg Creek, the Cronenberg path. Right. Yeah, it's, well, I mean, I mean, this is it's an issue point. I mean, they actually did the, they did an expedited uh, design process for two of these parks before. Yeah. And none of us are very impressed. With yeah, the as results. you say, it had its flaws, but it was done in about four or five months. Right, and um, it was crap. So I, I think that if we're going to do a good process and come up with good park designs that are going to be serve all of our community with an eye to equity, with an eye to folks that, that don't have access to parks, all the things, it's going to take longer than the six months that they did that process. And what you and just that's not described even counting finding the consultant and hiring the consultant. And what that entails is a lot of staff time. I mean, especially given because that is a lot about outreach. And so, you know, I mean right. the, the consultants, we when we did when we did our vision, we had well actually the climate action plan is a better example. We had two consultants. We had a consultant designing our climate action plan, and we had a consultant doing outreach. I don't believe that we will have to commit an entire FTE to this process for a while. I think at least a year before we have to commit that kind of stuff. Again, as you keep saying, we are not the experts in that. But I've been doing this now for 100 years now, eight years, it just feels like 100. And I have a pretty good idea. You're talking about the three parts. I'm talking about the three parts because that's what's on the table for us. Milwaukee Bay Park, we theoretically have a parts district that's going to build that. So all that is, it theoretically, should be lawyer time, which is going to happen one way or another, which was theoretically already kind of happening. So that doesn't require a goal for us to negotiate that contract. And negotiate or not negotiate a new IGA. And figure out funding and help NCPRD you know, try to figure out funding. And you well, know, there's so many pieces to this that's not one piece. Yeah. Figure out funding. How to go for more funding how to go for a funding level that will adequately support our parks to, so that we don't have to hire a maintenance crew, right? Um, 
you know, I mean, it is, um, I do remember this about the, in 2014, they went out for additional, to raise the rate. They wanted to raise it from 54 cents to 85 or something like that. Um, it passed in Milwaukee, it passed in a couple of precincts in Oak Grove, and it failed everywhere else. Um, it was, I mean, I don't know if we were the lowest in the state, but we are something like one quarter of, I mean, ours is 54 cents over in Tualatin Valley, which is in all those lovely parks. It, they're paying $2 per hundred. I think Bend is 180 or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's ridiculously low. It was a ridiculously low ask when they did it. And they tied governance to it right. rather than doing two separate things. It was a very they handled it about as poorly as, as a thing like that can be handled. And then they didn't support it. So and that's, again, though, that is our parks district. It is not our job, nor is it our place, to cause our parks district to do their job. We, I mean, we couldn't even put that. that we couldn't, right? We can advocate as an art. We can do what we can do the advocacy at the board, but they're the ones that would have to put the question right. to the voters. There again, we're not the one. We're not the driver of any kind of funding process. No, but having and all of these dialogues requires sound time. Having all these dialogues and figuring out what it is we want to ask for. I mean, we don't really know yet. I mean, we want to ask, we want Milwaukee Bay Park built, but I mean, we don't know what's going to be the answer. And I think there's just so many levels and layers, and it's a peeling an onion. It's, there's so many things going on. It's the Milwaukee Bay Park, it's the three B parks, it's the maintenance, of the, you know, I, I don't see it as the design of parks as much as the ongoing maintenance and I think that is so you've got design then you've got build then you've got to worry about maintenance that's at least two years off probably closer to three before we have to worry about before we have to have maintenance in place granted we have to do things before that point to get there but finished parks that need maintaining are three years off when I have talked to staff about this issue, it has been clear that that process needs to be had before you get to the point where you have a built park. Sure. So I, I think your timeline is wrong. No, all I said was it's three years before we have a park that needs to be taken. Well, and I'll point out one example, which Anne knows well, uh, of why to some degree, we can't put off maintenance till after they're built, um, which is um, Balfour Street Park. Balfour Street Park has apparently some fruit trees in it. And the neighborhood one wants to keep the fruit. In, in the course of the prior uh, master planning, the neighborhood wanted to keep the trees, and then security said, no, we can't keep fruit trees. That's too much maintenance. That's too messy. That's too blah, blah, blah. They, I mean, I think there are some in the neighborhood who'd like to even, you know, do more fruit trees, have more of a permaculture kind of a park. Um, I don't know if that's where the process will go. I'm not trying to prejudge that in any way. I'm just saying that's an example of where you can't put off the maintenance question until uh, it plays into the park design. Right. It plays sure. into the park design. But there's policy things that have to occur. Right? We have to make a decision, okay, are we just going to spitball here? Are we willing to uh, create a, some kind of a fee that uh, we then take over the maintenance of our own neighborhood parks and NCPRD continues to run the big parks? And then do we want to go out to the community and have a conversation? Okay. In order to have really great parks, this is what we think we need to do because NCPRD doesn't have enough money to do all the And things. that's another part of it. <laughs> right, <sure. Yes. laughs> but these are all things that I think there is some time lag for. We can be talking about it, we can be working on it. There will be a, a 
certain amount of staff time, but I do not believe enough staff time that it rises to the level of the goal. And that is not even weighing it against the question of what we're throwing out to do that as a goal. And I fundamentally disagree with your assessment based on the number of conversations I have had with staff where I've asked questions about what is the process we would need to take? What do we need to be thinking about? And the response I get is, we need to start. And six months to a year, we can manage to wait. We can't wait longer than that. Potentially, we need to start in a year. Not potentially. Okay, I, I have been the only one on this council that has actually passed two bonds. That's great. And I have been part Why of the Why do we of hire experts who know how to do their job if we are going to ignore the input they provide around how to do this work? Well, I haven't I, actually got I have not input. received that input either. And so I'm, I'm actually like a little, I really think we need to like pump the brakes a little bit on that because I don't. Yours, what we're saying is, if if we decide that we're going to have this conversation now about all of this and and, and talk and generate funding sources, then we have then that that's going to require this amount of staff time. But we haven't. I, I don't. I don't agree that that is the timeline that we should be working from. And I don't agree that isn't that there aren't a lot of political conversations that have to happen first because we have we are not a now to start having conversations about what the relationship is and what the funding sources might be because we still have a lot of government to government conversations still to have with the Clackamas County Board and County Commissioners. We are not there. And this goal, I think, is I think it's premature and it's potentially setting sending a message we don't intend to send. We need to be super careful about how we're having this conversation around this goal. Because what I hear is putting, we're, we're, we're steps ahead of where we are. And we do need to have a conversation about what we are leaving behind and leaving off the table when we say we are going to hit pause on housing. Because there is a lot that we still could be doing. We are not at a point where we can say, after the time that we've spent on housing, we have pulled all the levers on policy. So before we jump to housing, I think we should close out the conversation about parks. Do we have a request for staff here? Is there more information that, because it sounds like we are on different pages. I think it's because some of us don't want to hear what we're being told. But if there is a way to resolve that by asking staff for something specific, then can we please make that request of staff? What's the request? That's my question. I feel like I have a pretty clear understanding of what we need, and that's what I've been fighting for. I'm hearing that that is not something that you all feel about. Well, here's how I feel. We will be doing the parts work that we will be doing one way or another, whether it's a parts, whether it's a goal or not. This is going to happen. It has to happen because we have this money coming down the funnel. We have what a park on the bubble. We will be doing that much work. Where do you think that work comes from? It's like anything government, there are things that arise that you just have to deal with. Was the pandemic a goal? Did we deal with it? Did we come up with the staff time that we required in order to deal with the thing that came up? It's a great example because dealing with the pandemic has just about broken the city. And we got through it gracefully. But it cost a lot of people a lot of their lives, including housing. And we are talking about diverting resources from the biggest, most important, most expensive single 
budget item in household, household budget. Literally 25% of Milwaukeeans are spending more than 50% of their income I'm familiar on housing. With the figures. Well, I'm sorry, but you're not giving it high enough importance. When you tell me, hold on, let's hold on the housing question. I want to talk about parks. This is what I hear. We cannot have these two conversations in a vacuum because they are related. We are taking resources from the most important thing that affects Milwaukeeans' lives to have a conversation about how we're going to manage and maintain some parks when we haven't even had the political conversations with the partner, we need to have those conversations before we dedicate staff time to start figuring those questions out. We don't even know what the questions are. I'm, we can't determine, it would be irresponsible for us to determine and to tell staff, this is the quest. Because we still are having a conversation with a jurisdictional partner about what that relationship looks like right now in our existing relationships, our existing agreements. And that is an important conversation. And I will say what I've already said several times before. I think we could hold on making parks a goal for six months to a year, based on my understanding of the work it will take and the timelines involved. What I have not heard is any sort of engagement with that proposal. I guess I would also add that I think, um, you know, we, we talk about the staffing for all of this. I mean, to me, the park is, is a, such a hard thing to put your head around because there are different there are so many different parts to it, and some of them are, are political, and some of them are not political, and you know, some of them are financial. Um, but the staff who are doing this are the staff who are supposed to be doing our climate goal and our tree work. So, I mean, we are stretching those staffs and those goals thin. And it is our leadership. It is our directors, it is our city manager, and it is our assistant city manager who have other jobs that they are also tasked with doing. And I would go back on the on the point that Councillor Falconer was making about housing being the most pressing need for families. I mean, I think that's hard to hard to deny. Um, but we're not stopping housing. I mean, we're not stopping working on housing. There's a lot of work that still goes forward. There's the CET work. There's our work on Cocoa Point. You know, there's there's 500 plus units in the pipeline. Um, there are. I, I think it's true. We haven't done everything we could do, but I think it's also true. Like we said last time, that let's let what we've done take some shape and take some force and see what we learn from it. And maybe in two years, it's time to put housing back as, as a goal. But let's let what we put into place play out and see how it plays out and see what we need then. And I want to add, my head, you're so happy because I have a four page speech, single space, single <laughs> space written up here. So you're just getting little sections here. Um, and I'm sorry to some degree that I didn't give you the whole speech because I think that there's been some very concerning um, miscommunication and misinformation flying around the community about what goals are and what we do around yes, housing, I totally what a city can do, what the county does, um, and, and I'm deeply disturbed that, uh, so that that's going on. Right. We've gone all over the place at this point, but I will give you this piece. There is a mismatch that we have going on right now. When we're talking about what we can do and what we're already committed to do. We are already committed in housing and housing affordability to ongoing work around translating all of those housing policies we put together in the comprehensive plan into code. If you're not familiar with the language of city government, 
policies that are going to talk about the ideas, the values, what we want to see happen. Code is where we, rubber meets the road, put it into play. We have a huge code package coming in December that's going to put the first slew of that into place, and that's all around um, individual house units. You know, single, we call them single family residents, single unit residents, whatever, and updating that code. And that's going to enable a lot more middle housing to be built. We have, after that, a work plan that Laura, our senior planner, shared with us in April that stretches out to 2026 and encompasses even more code work that is also coming out of that comprehensive plan. And that's further code work that's going to streamline code, that's going to talk about multifamily, that's going to look at how we can pull more levers and make it as easy as possible to do the work of building housing that is affordable to people. That goes out to 2026. It also encompasses the required work around HB 2003. We're committed to that work no matter what. Against that backdrop, we have this capacity issue where we are out of planners. There is no more money. There are no more planners to do more housing work at this point in time. The planners are the people who are going to do this work. They're up to their necks in the housing code updates and they are handling the flood of development applications that we have coming our way, which is, you know, the 500 units of affordable housing that we talked about already, the hundreds of units of market rate housing that are also coming our way. This is a good thing. I'm glad that our planners are busy, okay? But we don't have more people. We will not get more staff to do more things if we have housing as a goal. Entire community development team is working. There is no more there. We can't ask them to do even more than they are already doing. And this is the thing I keep trying to say, and I feel like it's not getting across. We're not walking away from this goal. We're not ignoring it. We're also at a point where we, we can't add more to it because there's no one to do the work. And there is no money to put toward hiring more people. Glad I didn't do the whole speech. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love to hear those speeches have flow. No, you can ask Colin for a review. <laughs> Did you practice it for Colin? <laughs> and we're not getting it? I don't think you really want to hear it. So, we are in a very interesting place where know that we have to do more work on housing. We know that we have to do work on parks, whether we want to or not. It's coming. We have to continue to do our climate work and we have to do our equity work. Those are all things that we have to do for our community. We've often framed our goals as being around what? the staff capacity, the budget, funding to do the things, all the things that whichever goal it entails. I can't remember what all of the parameters and opportunities are in the, what did we get, 4.65 million? You know, the ARPA dollars? ARPA dollars. Perhaps, there is a way to go back and sit down and look at those dollars and say, okay, this parameter right here could allow us to maybe work on this, but this parameter right here could allow us to maybe work on that. I think we should re-examine that and figure out if there is some room for a uh, temporary staff or whatever is required to do things. because. Everybody at this dais is right. That's that's the honest to God truth. Everybody here is right. We should be doing more housing. We should be doing more climate. We should be doing our own. We've got to work on the parks and we need to remove the dam. All of that's true. That's all true. We 
we have had a process where we've picked three goals in the past because that was staff capacity. This is not the past. This is the year when somebody handed us $4.65 million. <laughs> I think we should maybe take a step back and look at what, what are the opportunities embedded in that to do all of these things that we know we should do. Because I do think there are more levers we can pull on housing. And I do know that our planning staff and our community development staff are flat out. And I do know that we're going to be doing parks work whether we want to or not. So when you have all these things that are true, then you have to go, OK, so what are other ways to look at this? What are other options? What's another way to possibly solve this problem? And I think that's personally what the next conversation needs to be. Is, is there a way to leverage the, any of those funds towards doing all of these things that we know we have to do? I did look at the budget. These funds cannot be used for parks and they cannot be used for housing because of our of where we sit in the CDBG funding process, like how, how we're designated under CDBG. So when you say it can't be used for housing, can't be used to buy nails and build houses or can't be used for a planner to do policy work? It's not an allowable use under the funds. So um, and I I'm sure that there are 16 ways that if you guys would like to end tonight and you would like to have that be your ask, you're welcome to have that as your ask. But they can be used for hiring a consultant on parks. They cannot. They cannot. No. The, the funds, the funds that, that we got from, from the state, state can be okay. used for hiring an equity consultant to do our master planning work. That was very specifically called out as a Work. It cannot be used for um, managing the contractor or, or managing actually all the engagement work that goes into it from public to see the Well, yeah, I think it would be useful to have a little more granularity on that, on both the ARPA money and the limits on the on the state money. And maybe the time, maybe, you know, also if that means we don't discuss it till September, we will know more about where conversations are going with the county. Is there a way to make a compromise? Well, that's what I was trying to <clears throat> what I hear you saying is it's at least you could see six months to a year. Could we put housing on the goal for one year and revisit it in one year and see what all we can do from that now until that one year time? Yeah, that's, I think that's an option too. We can, we can see what we can get accomplished on housing. We can, Angel has started a list of, you know, both of things that we need to do on housing, levers we can pull. We can all sit down and look at that list and go, okay, which of these things are we going to do either way? Which of these things could we get going over the next year? And is that sufficient to where we would feel comfortable? having that process continue to play out well then turn our goal to parks. It's a possibility. It's a good idea. Um, I think those are both things that we should explore. If we're going to do that, we cannot just have it be what do we want to do. It has to be what is staff capacity to complete 
Well, I mean, then the same, then the, then the, I mean, we need to be putting the same question for parks. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, I, I mean, I don't think it's fair to put that on housing and not parks. Why are we saying housing has one has a one year goal? Why aren't we saying parks has a one year goal? I disagree. I mean, great. I love copper mines. I actually love it a lot. I, I'm willing to say, you know what? This is the one time that we need to actually have four goals. We've said three. I understand it, but we we do need to we need to be like working both of these things, and we still have this, 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 and this. There are specific. We we know the roadmap for housing. We actually have a much better roadmap for housing than we do parks. I like to see where we are on parks in the year. Where is that conversation in the year? Your proposal to move it to four goals illustrates that I'm still still not saying it clearly or loudly enough that we, we are at capacity. We need to choose. Unless we can find more capacity. Sure. If we can find more money to do more things, of course that changes the equation. But we are at capacity. I don't. I don't know how else to say it. But that is true, as Angel says, both ways. Right. So right now, what we're generally thinking about is that the parks work will be in Peter's body. Right. What's Peter currently working on? Everything. Well, twelve <laughs> master plans, the trees, climate. He's full out. Natalie's full out. So. If we do parks, are we then hiring somebody else then to do parks? So in either case, if we are at capacity with current staff, then we're at capacity. Because we're at capacity on that staff too. And so to do either one, we're going to have to increase capacity to someone. It's not, it's not a question of whether we're our entire community development department is working on housing right now. All of them are touching housing work in some fashion. If we are doing parks, we have work that comes down that is going to land on Kelly, that is going to land on Anne, that is going to land on Peter, that is going to land on Natalie, that is going to land on probably other people that I can't identify because I don't actually direct staff. But I've run organizations before, and I know what it looks like when you're at capacity, and you have to make hard choices. Otherwise, people, fit, people fizzle out, and you don't get the work done. So what I'm trying to say is that if you make those choices, that's, that's the whole reason we have been so successful the past five years, the reason we have achieved as much as we have is because we have committed to staying within our capacity as much as we possibly can. And we've exceeded it over the past year and a half because we've also had fires and ice storms and a pandemic and, and, and. And yes, those crises unfold on the people in our community and it is terrible. But we have to be realistic about the amount of work that we can do. My understanding from staff is that we can probably manage to put off doing work on parks for six months to a year, but no more. And that, well, that's a suit. You're talking about the three. I've been trying not to say anything. I'm really sorry. But uh, the planning for the parks, I'm hiring somebody next week. Like, it's going live as a position. We're then bringing someone up. Like, it's, it's actually happening you now. I think that the question is at what point do you all know more? And at what point can you make different decisions about funding and other things? So I just I need to be clear. Like, we're, we have to do certain parks work. In case the senator and representative are watching tonight, I do not work here. Hiring these people. Yes. 
I'm sorry, and that's a consultant contract? No, I actually have to have an I have to have an actual project manager for mm -hmm. three parts. It's enough work that even with a contractor on board, just to learn what happens in the city, like to know where you're doing your public engagement, to be able to make sure it gets through planning and zoning because there's gonna be a planning process. There's just a bunch of stuff that goes into it as a construction manager. It's the same thing we did with the library where Layla was doing about 50% of her job and then we hired an out-of-house construction manager. Yeah, we consulted for that work after after some time. Yeah, we hired a construction manager. Layla was still doing it for 50% of her time through the construction. So I'm still not sure what you're saying you're doing. You're hiring a staff oh, or I'm hiring, you're... I'm hiring a project manager for the three, the construction of the three parts. So uh, that's a limited term work. employment? It is. It is limited term and it is uh, it has to be done by the time we move to the new city hall because I've doubled up those funds at that point. And that is then someone who needs to be a manager, the project manager needs to be managed. I'm just trying to highlight that it's not just neat and tidy and tied up and taken care of. Adding people as well. Well, it's interesting to me because that almost sounds like, oh, we hired somebody, that's what we do with each of these goals. So that's like a person we hired to do a goal. Um, so if, if you want me to, I'm happy to talk, but nobody's called on me tonight. So I don't, I know this is your conversation and I'm trying to respect that. It's up to you as to whether I'm going to be So uh, the first part is, is when we decided that we were going to take these funds, we had to hire somebody. We're using a time limited position that we actually had vacant um, in order to hit the deadline. That person's sole job is going to be making sure that the three projects are constructed. That person will not be working on any of the intergovernmental affairs work that is going to be required over the next six months. It's not going to be involved in any of the IGAs or any of the other stuff that you will have been talking about tonight. If, um, what I have said and what I had said to all of you individually was if, if all we care about is the construction of three parks, this doesn't need to be a goal. If this is about our relationship with NCP and funding and bigger things than that, then it does need to be a goal. So that was sort of what I was talking to each of you, that was the parameters that I was placing on it. So if you're comfortable with us working on just constructing these three parks, um, we can do that, we have to do that, uh, but it doesn't get you sort of that broader goal. Um, Relationship stuff and IGA stuff, legal stuff. Well, in Milwaukee Bay Park. Correct. And it doesn't answer the question of oh, what happens once those three parks are built. It does not. That is so. Correct. Realistically, what is the timeline for those three parks being built? So, um, and the mayor and I have talked about this. The construction of the projects is that they would be done in August of 2024 uh, with a punch list. Of in December of 2024. It's going to take us two summers in order to construct the parks just because of water and you never know when you're going to get rain out of a construction site on a park. So we need the extra season to make sure we can get the deadlines. The issues that you start to run into is uh, depending on how you maintain the parks, you actually need revenue in hand in order to pay for those services, whether it's to pay for the staff or the equipment or the other pieces. That's the piece that's going to come sooner. Uh, than the three year mark. So, in order to have construction crew, not construction, I'm sorry, people using the park for maintenance, depending on how we do the maintenance agreement, uh, you would need to have that solidified within 18 months of us going, you know, us opening the parks. The second piece is I also need to know um, kind of where we are with the IGAs, or I don't know, and it actually comes from maybe. Thank you. you. You said it perfectly. Uh, I can design a park one way. NCPRD can design it another way. Um, and if they're maintaining it, they're going to insist that they design it their way, not our way. So we do need to have some of that clarity in order to make a determination about who is is actually making the final calls on the design attributes of the plans. And that's soon. Uh, we will be, we actually will be done with all the design work within the year. 
So that's part of why we had to put the position out. We've got to get the consultants on board. This this actually is going to be a very uh, Peter was what <laughs> he was nervous uh, that we have even post the position. It's out as of I think Monday. Um, but it's it is the tightest schedule construction schedule that we've done I've ever managed. It's that tight. But I made a commitment to the senator and the representative that we will have the funds out and we are committed to having funds expended in the first bill within that bill. But so like you said, I mean, I, and what, yeah. So if we're going to try to have a design done by the end of the year. Correct. Uh, we have to have ironed out those questions. Correct. With NCPRD about All of who this. makes the call yeah. on maintenance or you know what what we can build because who's going to maintain it and Absolutely. blah 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 yeah. and and how so it doesn't sound to me like it's a year out it's not it's actually probably within three to four months that you have to have those decisions made um, in order for us to even start this process or at least a decision it's all of you about where you want staff going um but depending on the decisions that may it are made it's a lot of staff work actually to, to do additional steps in order to So I take it Maybe six months. There you go. Before we need a decision. A ground up road decision. That's what we need for six months. So that's just the conversations with the commissioners. Well I mean Ironing that out and then but us deciding what we're willing to do beyond that. But some of those decisions aren't for us to decide. Some of those decisions would be for our residents to decide. Some of those decisions would be for NCP or E to decide. There's a lot of decisions that go beyond just us deciding who we want to have do that. There's then the decision of what does our community want for us to do. So I do think that it's a two September, do we have some bandwidth on? Uh, we can move anything around. So if you at the first meeting in September is the second. Right? I want to say it's the seventh. Maybe on that. It is the seventh. So it's the seventh or uh, fourteen or twenty-first. If you all want this to be on the seventh, we can pull this off the agenda. And move it out. Okay. How much time would you like? Spent two hours? So. No, so it's an hour and a half. Figure it for an hour and a half. Yep. Or questions, or well, I guess it would be, you know, it would be good to know what in what ways the ARPA money gives us flexibility. Some in, yeah, where we might have some wiggle room based on that. I mean, I know you had mapped out like, you know, some of it's reimbursement, some of it's. The only money that was reimbursement was CARES Act. Oh, okay. uh, so all the ARPA funds have the same rules and their structure. But I, I'm happy to get you guys in the other way. say that, in case it wasn't clear, um, I don't believe we can stop having housing as a whole. Um, 
based on a multitude of conversations I've had since our last session. I don't believe we can not have that as a point. I believe we still have work that additional work we can do that will make a difference in people's lives. I also personally believe that we can do both. That we can be moving the process along on parts while continuing to do more work on housing and climate and in a year conversation and see where we are on things. Now, in a year we may have figured out how to fund climate and that can come off the boat. That just becomes part of the operations of the city. It could happen. Strange that would things. be a good goal. I think that would be awesome. Well, we'll just find a way to embed equity in everything so that equity doesn't have to be <laughs> a goal. That's we are on it. Everything you do. Exactly. Absolutely. It's absolutely the way it should be. But it may take us a little while to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken us 400 years to screw that up. It'll probably take us a little bit to get to that. Good work, everybody. Fierce, heartfelt work. Very proud of this council. Before we adjourn, um, the question came up earlier about whether we wanted to continue in person oh, yes. or not. Um, I like meeting in person, but I am going to defer to the people with children and how they feel about that. So. I, I, we don't have to decide tonight, but I just wanted to say that um, I will go either way, whatever. Yeah, I concur entirely. I prefer in-person meetings, but again, I will defer to two of you because you have a have this people. I really appreciate everyone um, keeping their masks on today. Yeah. I really you know, having the door open. And I'm glad we didn't have a room full of people. Um, so. Those are also considerations you know, for us to be thinking about um, making that decision. I hope that we can work out the glitch so that we can have a better hybrid experience. Um, so I know it's a work in progress, and thank you so much for stepping up to the better way. Very good work. Thank you. You got your workout. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so we're letting Scott go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's right. Right. I'm sorry. Scott, Scott made a lot of um, really good groundwork. So. He, since he will be watching this at some point, thanks, Scott, for, for that, and thank you all. Appreciate you. So, and obviously the Delta variant is a moving target, right? So in two weeks, we may have a very different world than the one we have tonight. So I don't expect us to make a decision tonight, but um, I, I, are you with us that we're going to let? Okay, so basically, and we're happy to have that conversation if you want our thoughts or advice or whatever. I, I guess my, my ask would be that, you know, you know everybody, um, you know, if, if we need to go with a hybrid meeting, um, that we put as much behind making that successful as we possibly can. Because I am, things, it's, it's, things have changed. Things feel very different. Please don't move this to hybrid. Honestly, tonight was a disaster. I mean, I love that you guys are being so sweet about it, but this was really painful. Um, so if we're gonna do it, I really would appreciate, just because counselors either are out there, either, either or for now, until Scott can figure out what's coming. Okay. Then I, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, let's let's look at it again uh, in a couple weeks and see, see where everything's at. And then we can make that decision. Thank you. Else, and I would entertain a motion. I'll move to adjourn. 
I'll second. And then move to second it to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.